She's never gone missing before. She's just staying at her friends, you know, she's hiding. Maybe she's drunk a bit too much and she's sleeping it off. My Facebook blew up with her face, basically. It was everywhere. Well, I just remember wondering what's happened and what's going on. You know, the gut feeling was getting stronger and stronger that something serious had happened. This is something you see on the TV. This is something you read in papers. There was a huge search operation going on over many days involving dogs, air support and boots on the ground. And I knew then that that was my Louise. I knew she'd gone. In the Hampshire town of Havant, sits the close-knit community of Lee Park. It's a nice, quiet area. It's nice living here, friendly. My neighbours are really nice, you know. It's a very, very cosy area to live in. I've lived here 47 years, eh? People's all lovely. I enjoy the place, I really do. It's safe, and that's what made us move here, was the fact that it was safe and secure. There was very little crime. When things happen, the community does pull together and help the people out. So I think in a whole, Lee Park is a good place to live. Lee Park is also the home to popular 16-year-old Louise Smith. As a baby, like as a newborn, she was really just quite a quiet baby, to be honest. She used to sleep through the night regularly. She was just a, a really good little girl. Bradley, my brother, used to come and stay with me, with her. And she'd just come in and say, can I play with your, your shoes, Auntie Haley?" She'd go in my shoe cupboard, get all my shoes, and she'd clonk up and down the kitchen and in the, in the hall, and she loved it. She loved dressing up, you know? She was just so, oh, she was just a lovely little girl. Really good girl. And as she grew up, she began to toddle around. You know, she started to show her cheeky sense of humour. You know, sometimes I'd look at her and she just had a certain look in her eye. And I knew, I just knew she was going to come out with something. I just knew straight away. You know, and she was, she was quite a bright and happy child. As a young teenager, Louise enjoyed holidays and days out with her aunts and nan and loved going to theme parks with family friend Sharon. Louise, honestly, she had adrenaline rush on the roller coasters, especially on the smaller Alton Towers. She'd come to Legoland, she'd come to Chesington, she loved Chesington, especially like the Tigers and that. Louise was like my own daughter. We just really enjoyed each other's company. Louise's parents split and her father Bradley later moved to Scotland but maintained a close relationship. I used to have her every fortnight for a weekend. School holidays, half terms, I'd have her for a week. And one summer holiday, she stayed with me for five weeks, you know, because um, she just wanted to stay with me. And so, you know, whenever I could, she came up to visit. Um, we went to Edinburgh. She always wanted to see Greyfriars Bobby and touch, touch his nose, the statue for luck. By chance, when she came up, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival was on and we walked around and saw it and she, yeah, she loved it. I could have her as much contact with her as I wanted. I was always allowed a good relationship with her, you know, without any problems. After school, Louise moved to a local college and studied veterinary care. She loved animals. There was no doubt about that. She absolutely loved animals. Like I said, we went to Chesington and out of everything, it was the animal show she wanted to watch. She just wanted to do anything, I think, with animals. You know, and the world was her oyster. I think her, her plans were just to get the course done and then decide what direction she was going to take with it. Being a typical teenager, it wasn't long before Louise's attention shifted towards other interests. Louise always had a boyfriend, always interested in boys. She's a very pretty girl, so there was no reason for her not to have a boyfriend. But some boyfriends wasn't the right sort of boyfriend for her. She went to college and I think 
she had a boyfriend and she struggled a bit and I think she just wanted to be with him a lot. She wasn't interested in anything else, you know, she just wanted to be with him. It's like, I'd rather talk to my boyfriend than my parents, you know what I mean? It was one of them. But certainly had a, you know, had chats with her, the do's and don'ts. Not that she'd ever bloody listen to me, but, um, yeah. But in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the UK. And a national lockdown meant that Louise would be spending more time isolated at her mum's house. Unable to see her new boyfriend, tensions started to grow at home, prompting Louise to pack a bag and move in with her cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, nearby. And to begin with, she seemed happy. But a few months later, everything changed. After Louise moved in Lee Park, she was regularly texting her friend, saying how they treated her like a child. Having had an argument, Louise left the home address on the 7th of May. She was contacted numerous times on her phone, I think over 50 times, and didn't respond. But at some point, Louise decided to go home and clear the air, and things were sort of getting back to normal. After making up with her cousin and Shane, the following morning, Louise makes plans for a special national holiday. On the 8th of May, which was actually Victory in Europe Day 2020, where there were lots of celebrations going in, in gardens, etc., in people's homes, that morning she woke up and she did a Snapchat around about midday saying that she's got, you know, a huge hangover, her head hurts as a result of drinking. It was established that Louise was going to meet her boyfriend at the skate park at around about 3 p.m. that afternoon. But we know that Louise didn't arrive at the skate park and that's when concerns were being raised by her boyfriend. Louise's cousin makes numerous attempts to call her mobile, but after an hour of phoning, the line disconnects. And by 6 p.m., Louise's cousin is left with no choice but to call 999. Some details would have been taken by the call taker at that point to establish how high risk Louise was and what were her vulnerabilities. Obviously, she was 16 years of age, so one would argue she's still a child and therefore vulnerable anyway. But we would also look at our records to see what we know about Louise. Some could say she was streetwise, only been missing three hours, not particularly alarming at that particular point. And there was no other information to suggest she would be high risk at that stage. With the case considered fairly low risk, Police don't arrive at Louise's cousin's address until 1am to write up a missing persons report. And those inquiries would be basic inquiries, speaking to friends and family, where she may be hanging out. Shane explains to police that he accompanied Louise towards the skate park in Emsworth that afternoon, before heading off in a different direction towards Tesco. Officers want to know if there could be any reason why Louise may have left of her own accord. So if it came out that she had had a falling out, then the police may take the view, well, she's sulking, she's just going to be staying with a friend or hanging around a park or something overnight, teaching them a bit, bit of a lesson to, to worry about, you know, and then she'll turn up safe and well in the morning. But the following morning, there is still no signs of Louise. I actually got a, a message saying Louise has gone missing, but lockdown was on. And I technically was in a different country. I didn't know if I could travel. I was trying to arrange things. She'd never gone missing before. She'd obviously stayed at people's houses, but she always let people know where she was. I just thought, no, she hadn't. She's just a it's drama. It was like, you know, I thought, no, perhaps she's just saying it just to let everyone believe that she's gone missing. She's just staying at her friends, you know, she's hiding. Yet as friends and family try to reach out to Louise with no luck, concern sets in. It was completely out of character for her to disappear entirely, especially not be on her phone, because she was always on her phone. That was the scary thing. That was the thing that niggled in my mind, um, you know, made me think, maybe something has happened, maybe something has happened. But I tried to block them thoughts out and think of it differently and go, no, she's, she's just missing, she's going to turn up, because the alternative was just too upsetting. In the Hampshire suburb of Lee Park, concern is growing for 16-year-old Louise Smith, 
who was last seen heading towards a nearby skate park the previous afternoon to meet her boyfriend. And with a missing person investigation underway, police attempt to paint a picture of Louise's life before she disappeared. I would describe Louise as a typical 16-year-old girl. She was going through that phase with her mother where she was starting to rebel a little bit. She wanted her own independence. They would regularly have arguments at home. She wanted to spend more time with her boyfriend. And you've got to remember, this was at a time uh, during the pandemic when lockdown was occurring. And so tensions were high in most households, I would suggest. Police also take into consideration what else was going on during the day Louise vanished. The day that Louise went missing was the 8th of May, which was the E day, and that was being celebrated nationally. So there were lots of parties going on, but because this was locked down, the government restrictions at that time meant that you could only celebrate in your garden. But there was a huge party atmosphere going on within the community. And again, as a police officer, you're thinking, well, perhaps Louise has gone to one of these parties. And maybe she's drunk a bit too much and she's sleeping it off. If she's gone to friends and it is during lockdown, then potentially the friends might be thinking, well, I may have committed an offence here during lockdown and I don't want to tell the police that Louise is staying with me. So there's some additional difficulties at that particular time with that miss missing in-person inquiry. As the hours tick by, police dig deeper, questioning friends and family in the hope of finding clues into Louise's disappearance. Louise was 16 years of age. She's vulnerable by definition of her age anyway. We know that she'd had problems at home in the past. We know that she'd had mental health problems and also she was using alcohol. So all this uh, information coming in really ramps up our concerns and makes her a high risk missing person because of those vulnerabilities. And so her being out and not in contact with anyone is really concerning for me because she's a risk and not just to family members, but you know, other people out there could take advantage of her. And as night turns to morning, police issue an appeal to the public for sightings of Louise. When she didn't materialize the following day, that's when the concerns were raised. And so, as you would normally do with a missing person inquiry, you would release details of Louise's image to the local media. You'd be asking for the public's help. You know, did you see Louise? You know, was she at one of these parties? So I'm on a lot of Facebook groups, uh, local Facebook groups around the area. And there was missing pages saying that, you know, have you seen this girl? But yeah, it was just my Facebook blew up with her face, basically. It was everywhere. When we found out Louise was missing, I said we was all worried about her. I just remember being there, uh, missing posters, being around, everyone wondering what's happened and what's going on. It certainly took off on social media and the community were doing all they can to try and find Louise by reposting the appeals that the police had put out. Police continue to focus their inquiries in the area where Louise was reportedly last seen, the Emsworth Skate Park. Officers would be tasked to survey the area to see what CCTV cameras were in that area, going along the most obvious routes to take you to the skate park in Emsworth. We would capture that CCTV, which would be quite a time-consuming um, process, and then someone would have to review that footage. And while police scour the area for CCTV, the local community also gets involved in the search for Louise. A lot of people around Emsworth were looking for her, because obviously that was the the last place she was seen, that was their centre point and what I'm, I'm working out from there. The community seemed to come together to try and sort of help everybody to sort of get through the situation that we were in. There was people out all the time, um, in family and in, in the community Lee Park, there was loads of people out and about looking for her. You know, it was, it was a massive, massive hunt. There was lots of volunteers as well looking for her. I did go out in the car many of times looking for her. I remember once that I thought I'd see her and I jumped out the motor and I was hoping it was her, I think. And it, it did really look like her. Unfortunately, it wasn't her. But I just, I wanted to do all I could for Louise in the hope that I was gonna find her. There was a hell of a lot of hope that Louise Smith was gonna be found. Uh, safe and well. But as two days pass, 
there is still no signs of Louise. As the case got on during the lockdown, there was no more news. It started to get a bit more escalated and it definitely was an atmosphere in the local area. The gut feeling was getting stronger and stronger that something serious had happened. I think with any missing person inquiry, statistically, if someone isn't located within about 48 hours, the chances are they may not be alive. I think I just didn't allow myself to think like that because I just, the hope of her still, you know, of her turning up overrode everything out because that was my only concern. I just wanted my little girl to turn up. But it's when police look into the reason why Louise moved out of her mum's home at the start of lockdown, concern grows. She'd had an argument with her mum and she didn't like the, the boyfriend, the mum, who, who her mum used to call her stepdad. She didn't like him. She did not like him at all. So in the end, that's why she moved. That's why she moved out. Could this revelation be in any way connected to Louise's disappearance? But after making their inquiries, Police are able to rule out Louise's stepdad from the investigation. Attention then turns to Louise's boyfriend, who was due to have met her the afternoon of her disappearance. We were told that Louise was intending to meet her boyfriend at the skate park in Emsworth um, at 3 p.m. that afternoon. Her boyfriend was a nice guy. I dated him in year nine for about a month. His little teenage little thing. Um, just when you're kids and we're just good friends and I see him sometimes around here. But Louise's boyfriend claims she never turned up as arranged. So where did Louise go? With Louise's phone still switched off, police retrieve cell phone data to try to track her whereabouts on the day she went missing to establish if she did walk to the skate park. So we would expect to look at the call data and the cell site analysis to, to show that that's where her phone is moving. But actually what it did show was that it was moving in a completely different direction towards Haven Thicket. What a phone tells you is where the phone is. It doesn't necessarily tell you where the person is. So it could have been that Louise has lost her phone and someone's taken that phone and it's headed off in that direction. It could have been she'd, she'd been robbed and, and that phone's gone there. So always keeping an open mind. Six days into Louise's disappearance, there's a sudden breakthrough. Two people are arrested in Lee Park. I was just shocked. It was something I just thought, this is, this is something you see on the TV, this is something you read in papers, and I couldn't believe it. I was, I was just gobsmacked. Louise's cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, are taken in for questioning. Both were interviewed at length by detectives at local police stations. And Shane was adamant that he had done nothing wrong. As far as he was concerned, he walked with Louise the route that he said he walked towards the skate park, where she was then going to meet her boyfriend at three o'clock, and that was the last he saw of her. But for police investigating Shane's account, things don't add up. Having trawled hours of CCTV footage of the local area, there is no sign of Louise or Shane heading towards the skate park. Alarm bells start to ring in relation to Shane Mays. You start questioning, well, why is he lying? I think once you establish that perhaps some lies have been told to the police by people that were responsible for caring for Louise at that time, concern starts to raise. The latest evidence raises suspicion against Shane. But what led to his wife's arrest? I think when you look at the fact that she reported her missing only three hours after sort of a last sighting of Louise, because for me, a 16-year-old not coming home at six o'clock in the evening is not particularly something to be concerned about, particularly when it's not the parents raising the alarm. When you layer that with the other information that we're getting, it's starting to paint a picture that is one of concern. So having exhausted pretty much our inquiries based around the account that Shane had given us and also looking at Louise's phone data, it got to the point where we had made a decision that Shane hadn't been completely honest with us around Louise's movements and her disappearance. And so the decision was taken to arrest both of them on suspicion of kidnap.
In Havant, 16-year-old Louise Smith has been missing for six days after she failed to meet her boyfriend at a local skate park. Analysis of phone records and CCTV has failed to show signs of Louise going there, and investigations soon rule out her boyfriend. But police have arrested Louise's cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, on suspicion of her kidnap. So Shane Mays, I would describe, he was a 30-year-old man. He was out of work. Uh, his day consisted of pretty much getting up in the morning, going to the shops, returning home, and then spending uh, numerous hours on his computer, playing games. Didn't appear to be actively looking for work. Louise never said to me, oh, oh, oh I'm scared of him or anything. Like that. She never said that to me. She never told me that. With both Shane and his wife in custody, police conduct a search of their home for any sign of Louise. The police would have been looking for obvious evidence, but also it would have been a forensic search as well. So we would have seized all of their clothing that would have been worn on that day. We would have gone through any computers that were there. We would have taken phones as well to establish their movements, see if there were any other phones that we weren't aware of. Police find no evidence of Louise still in the house. So focus turns to Haven Thicket, since that was the last location of Louise's phone signal. What it allowed us to do was then focus all of our resources in that area to really flush out, you know, what clues were there and hopefully try and identify where Louise would be. And so there was a huge search operation going on over many days involving dogs, air support and boots on the ground looking for Louise or clues to establish where Louise may be. But also we could then move our media appeal to people that were using Haven Thicket on that day, VE celebration day, where a lot of people, you know, would have been out getting their fresh air during lockdown and may have seen something suspicious. So we were really focusing on that air at that point. While the search for Louise intensifies, police have no concrete evidence to prove Shane or his wife had anything to do with her disappearance. A decision was taken to release them on bail, but with conditions that they reside elsewhere other than their home address. And so they were placed in a local hotel near to their home address, which gave us the time and space to actually conduct our inquiries at their home address without interference from either party. You had a watch on 24 hours a day. There were 77 officers, vehicles surrounding the block. You had them knocking on doors in the general area obviously trying to see if they could get any further information. The police had been working on a theory of kidnap. But 13 days after going missing, everything changed. Louise's body was found in the north of the thicket, covered up. Louise's body had been severely damaged, both by fire, but also by violence, we believe. Um, there was some attempt to cover up the body with sticks and wood. Clearly, a fire had been set. It was fairly obvious at that point that this wasn't an accident, this wasn't self-harm, but this was a murder. We're just approaching the area where Louise's body was found, and you can see it's hugely dense here. You can't even see the footpath that we've just come off of, so you can only imagine what it would be like in the summer when you've got those really tall ferns around. So this is, this is the site where, sadly, Louise was found. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a fire that's, that's taking place here. I think that's what saddens me about this, is this is, it should be an area where kids can come and play and, and you know, have fun and relax and feel safe. But this kind of beautiful location has, has really been tarred now with this horrific attack. With a body found, the crime scene is immediately locked down and preserved so the body can be formally identified and clues to a potential suspect can be uncovered and a pathologist is called in. I was asked to attend at Havant Thicket. It was very clear from quite a distance away that we were dealing with a severely burnt body. Thinking about the nature of the attack at the scene, 
it was simply obvious that there was some severe damage to the face. Now that implied heavy impacts of some sort and it was also clear that a stick had been inserted into the body. That's the sort of thing that could not possibly have happened accidentally and so it was a question of identifying the particular stick and suggesting to the police how this might be managed. In this particular case, I said to them, I think what you need to do is to collect any DNA you can before anybody touches it. With the true horror of the crime unfolding, the police need to know who could be responsible for such a callous and brutal killing. As far as any more detail is concerned, there was really nothing much I could tell the police otherwise until we'd got on and got the body to the mortuary and uh, examined in more detail. And while Louise's remains are taken to the mortuary and DNA samples taken to the laboratory for examination, it isn't long before news reaches Louise's father while on his way to England to join the search. We was about halfway on the journey when I got the call um, to say they'd found a body. I was told, you can't tell anyone, you can't tell anyone. You know, nobody, not even your family, in case they say something because it could jeopardise the case. It was a very anxious journey because I just wanted to get here and you know see firsthand what was going on what's you know what's happening I had somebody message me that they had seen a black private ambulance come out of the thicket I got in the motor I drove down to the thicket obviously we weren't allowed into the thicket I had my friend in the car with me and there was just police everywhere and I knew then that that was my Louise. <sighs> I knew she'd gone. I remember it vividly, but I got the family round because Bradley was coming down. He came in and told me in the kitchen and I just broke down. I went, nah, it's not her. He went, hey, there's been a body found. I went, no. It's not her, it's not her. They got it wrong. It's not her. I just didn't think it would be. The news that everyone feared spreads across the tight-knit community. When I read the story on one of the local community pages saying that a body had been found, they couldn't reveal who it was, but parents of Louise had been told and it was absolutely horrible. The outpouring of grief was huge within the community, particularly on social media. There was a, a huge sense of upset and disbelief and I guess despair really, you know, and I think the same for the police, you know, I think you, when you're dealing with a missing person inquiry, you're always hoping that you're going to find that person safe and well. And then when I think when you do find a body, you know, it's, yeah, it just punches you in the guts, really. The hunt for Louise's killer is now on. And firmly in the police's sights is one man, Shane Mays. The person who had been looking after Louise. What we found at about ten past three that afternoon was an image of Shane Mays coming out of haven't thicket and walking towards his mother's address which is close by having said that he was at the other end of the town near the skate park in Ainsworth. the cctv evidence places shane near the scene of the crime and when police receive forensic evidence there's a breakthrough having carried out a number of examinations at both at the crime scene and also through post-mortem examination on louise and also the search that we did back at the Mays flat, we were able to establish that we had a DNA match from Shane Mays on a wooden stick that was found at the crime scene near Louise's body. But also a, a speck of blood was also found on his trainers, which came back to Louise's DNA. Shane Mays is re-arrested, but this time he's charged with the murder of Louise Smith. His wife is also re-arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. At a hearing, Shane Mays pleads not guilty to murder, which means a trial will ultimately take place. I'd say the pressure really starts at that point because you're then um, set fairly quickly a trial date. 
uh, where you need to be trial ready. It's a painstaking process. You need to be 100% sure that that is the person that you say is the killer of your victim. After further investigations and without any evidence against Shane's wife, she is released without charge. With all evidence pointing to Shane Mays and a trial now set, the question everyone wants the answer to is why would Shane want to brutally murder a 16-year-old girl living in his care? Shane Mays has been charged with the murder of 16-year-old Louise Smith after DNA and CCTV evidence linked him to the crime. While police prepare a case for trial, Louise's family and friends have the agonizing task of saying goodbye to their loved one. The day of Louise's funeral, there was hundreds and hundreds of people. People had gone out and put purple bows the night before her funeral on the lampposts. The community just all pulled together, it was lovely. You know, they all stood out on the streets and right from outside her house, right up to the crematorium. Seeing everybody out there, it was, it was overwhelming. For me, personally, being a very private person as well, it was also quite wonderful just to know that they were there. And Lou would have been looking down thinking, wow, I didn't realise I was so loved. You know, everyone was there, everyone, everyone. It was just, the world stopped just for a moment, just for her. Six months after Louise's funeral, the trial is set to begin at Winchester Crown Court. But just as the court case begins, there's a surprising twist. Day one of the trial, his defence team entered a plea for guilty to manslaughter. So effectively, he was saying, I admit to killing Louise, um, but I didn't mean to do it. He basically then admitted that he had taken her to have a chat and everything because they'd had a falling out the night before and that he basically just wanted a chat with her. They argued, she hit him with a stick apparently and then he attacked her because he lost his temper. He just lost control. He said that he just, like, hit her and punched her in the face and did what he did to her, horrific things. And then he said he walked away and he heard her moaning. We examined that plea. We weren't happy with that. We were confident it was a murder. We were confident this was pre-planned. And so we, we stuck with our guns and said, no, this is a murder trial and that's what we're going to be seeking for. As the prosecution presents its case, the jury is shown a Snapchat video showing Shane tickling Louise's feet while she was staying with him. Some of the things we heard in court was there was a lot of, um, you know, flirting going on between Shane and Louise. And, you know, she was still a child. He should not have been interacted with her in the way that he was. It wasn't appropriate at all. But according to neighbours, Shane had a more aggressive side. The feeling of my wife and I being around Shane Mays was one that we didn't want to be around him. Shane would be the sort of person, I believe, that would belt you for something if he thought you'd done something wrong. Running up the days to the incident, because they were upstairs neighbours, it was quite a lot of raised voices. A lot of it was targeted at Louise. The court then hears how unhappy Louise really was while living at Shane May's. When it came out in court that she was reaching out to other people, that she hadn't spoken to me about it, the only indication I ever got was one day she just said, look, I don't want to stay, I don't want to be here at the moment, Dad. I, I want to come up and see you. And as I said, lockdown stopped that plan, unfortunately. So it was horrible. It was an awful thing for me to deal with, you know, because I just felt like I'd let her down. Two days before Louise's disappearance, she phoned me and said she needed some lady products. And I believe that that might have been a cry for help because she wasn't happy. And unfortunately, 
I blame myself that I let her down. And I do live with that, knowing maybe if I'd gone and took that to her, that she might have just opened up to me and told me. The court has shown CCTV of Louise and Shane walking together the day before her murder. The day before the incident, we actually saw them. Louise did actually say hello, um, but that was about all. She seemed very reserved. I think Shane was having a really bad influence on her uh, to sort of try not to speak to anybody just focusing on getting back up to the, their flat. The prosecution reveals to the court horrific details from the post-mortem. In Louise's case, the whole central part of her face and both jaws had been broken into many pieces. The lower jaw in a couple of places and the upper jaw and the whole facial skeleton from the eyebrows down to the teeth broken into many pieces. The implication of that is that there have been some heavy blows from a heavy object. And the obvious thing in woodland would be a heavy branch of some sort, something of that kind. Large parts of the body had been burnt off. The upper limbs, the head, much of the chest, much of the belly wall at the sides especially, and to a certain extent at the front. The level of damage to Louise's body meant it was almost impossible to establish a cause of death. But the most shocking bit of information was yet to come. It was also clear that a stick had been inserted into the body. Something that was, I was asked about specifically was whether or not Louise was pregnant. Now, there was nothing left at autopsy to say that she might have been pregnant. The womb muscle itself was really quite well preserved. The lining of the womb that gives you a better idea of whether she might have been pregnant or not, all gone, long since vanished. So I couldn't say that. But the reason that's important is someone might have tried to, the assailant might have tried to disturb a pregnancy by putting a stick in there. That, that suggestion was made. After days of breaking down all their evidence to the courtroom, the prosecution pieced together the full horror of what likely occurred during the last few hours of Louise's life. That morning, Louise woke up and she'd arranged to meet her boyfriend that afternoon at the skate park in Emsworth. So having seen her phone active around about midday, we know that uh, Louise and Shane Mays left the address around about one o'clock. But instead of heading in the direction towards the skate park, her phone signal moves towards Haven't Thicket, revealing Louise's final movements on foot with her killer. How did Louise end up going to the thicket on foot with Shane Mays? There's no suggestion that she was forced there or dragged there. The thicket itself is huge and there are so many areas you can go to where you could not see anyone else. That started to show that this was pre-planned and that he lured Louise to that location that was remote with the intention of possibly sexually assaulting her. At some point, Shane assaults and murders Louise and is seen on CCTV leaving the thicket at 3.30 p.m., heading towards his mum's house. Around 5 p.m., he arrives at Iceland Supermarket in Lee Park. He went and bought some pieces for both him, CJ and Louise, knowing that Louise was never going to be returning home to eat that pizza. By 6.30 p.m., Shane's wife calls the police, reporting Louise missing. Hello, please, how can I help? I need to report a missing person. She's only 16. She's not come home. But I think once the police became involved, I believe that he realised that at some stage we were probably going to locate Louise because her phone would show that she was in Haven't Thicket. And so it's my belief that he returned to the crime scene at some stage, probably during nighttime hours, so that he wouldn't be seen. And he then built effectively a bonfire over Louise and set fire to her possibly using an accelerant to destroy the evidence, knowing that it's highly unlikely that you'd get a dog walker or a pedestrian walking through the thicket during the night reporting a, a small fire taking place. 
he went back a couple of days after and finished her off. We're hoping that she died instantly so she wouldn't go through all that pain. After a gruelling three-week trial at Winchester Crown Court, the jury returns its verdict. Shay Mays is found guilty of murder and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. I don't believe he should ever get out. I've always been the one that says, you take a life, you should do a life. I think capital punishment should be brought back. And I think they should lose their life like they took a life, but not straight away. I truly believe if you're sentenced to, as he was, 25 years, that he should serve that 25 years, knowing for that 25 years, at the end of that 25 years, he's going to die. Because that will have to deal with him in his head all the time. It's a psychological thing. And to me, that's a fitting punishment. With Shane Mays now behind bars, Louise's murder leaves a lasting mark on the local community. Now I reflect on it and I think, I wish I'd done this or I wished I'd done that, but obviously what's done is done. I can't do nothing about it. To think that something could happen or someone of her age, someone so young, dying of something so terrible, it, it makes you not want to walk the streets at night, especially as a female. It's never going to be the same in our little community here because what's gone on. It's been wicked, really. There's definitely a dark cloud lingering, definitely a, um, a sense of mourning, I guess, of, of Louise. And every time I drive past the thicket now, I always look, look in. You just think to yourself, that's where it happened. I don't think I could ever go there. And I don't really see many people go there when I drive past to go to the local shop. It's really much of a barren, kind of left-alone area now. And two years since her passing, family and friends try to come to terms to life without Louise. The thing that sticks in my mind is the last minutes of her life. Well, she's scared, you know, she must have been scared. She must have been so scared. That's what really hurts me, I think. She must be calling out for us so we could get to her. People say um, time will heal. It doesn't. Time allows you to cope better. And I am starting to cope a bit better now, but I'm not there. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll be having a good time. I'll be having a right, great day. And then I feel guilty. Because I'm like, why? Why should I be happy? Yeah, it's awful. And the whole family try to get on with it, but all of us think about her daily. Of course we do. Of course we do. We miss her. in the door, was not answering the phone. When she doesn't appear, people are surprised. She's usually very reliable. I think it was just a shock, because you don't expect that to sort of happen where you, where you live. Just unbelievable. It's like you're, you're in a movie. It's not even happening to you. Murder? What do you mean, murder? When the police reviewed the CCTV footage, they saw a person entering the flats. It's chilly. She's on her way to kill. Letchworth, England's first garden city, is a rural town situated north of Hertfordshire. Letchworth was founded by Ebenezer Howard at the start of the 20th century. He wanted people to move out of cramped conditions in places like London and come and live in the countryside. 
Lech was it, for somewhere to, to live is lovely, it's welcoming, it's, it's rural, but within easy reach of both Cambridge and London. I'm getting older, but I still find it's a very safe place to walk around. I just feel it's a very comfy place to live. I think um, people in Letchworth are really friendly. Um, often if you walk in, you know, they'll say hello. Life in Letchworth is really good. Uh, everybody's very friendly, can be very vibrant through the summer months. Uh, very nice place. Letchworth is a lovely place to live. Very quiet, very nice. No trouble, no trouble at all. Wouldn't live anywhere else. Beautiful place. And for 26-year-old carer, Nikki Collingbourne, it was the perfect place to live and work while remaining nearby to her family. We were like best friends, really. Not so much, we used to make a joke about her being my auntie because she was younger than me. But we were, all, like, we were just like really close friends, like sisters, really, because we were of a similar age. She always wanted children of her own and I think that made her very childlike, but in a good way. And she worked with children as well, so. Because she's so good with kids, like, amazing, like, just seeing any family, anyone's children, even their friends' kids, she was brilliant with. So obviously as I started having my children, she became quite involved and we'd often spend weekends together away, with kids, without kids. She was just such a kind person. Nikki was very funny, caring and loving. Everything about her, she was just a wonderful person. She'd drop anything to do, anything for anybody. Nikki's close family circle depended on her in their daily lives, and that included helping her mum and taking her to and from hospital appointments. But all that was about to change. Nikki's mother was very ill, and she was being treated in the Lister Hospital in Stevenage, which is about seven miles away. Nikki's due to collect her and when she doesn't appear, people are surprised. Nikki usually does all the running around, going to pick her mum up, make sure she's got everything, and she had not answered her calls, which was obviously very unlike Nikki. Nikki would never let anybody down on an appointment, never, unless it was absolute emergency. By the afternoon, I was a bit really worried, so I just sent her a text, and I just said, Nikki, if you need me, I'm here, blah, blah, and yeah. And then the next one I know, her mum had rung me and said, have you seen Nikki? She hasn't turned up to pick me up on hos from hospital. And I instantly knew. I knew something was not right. I went down, the car was there, so I knew she was in the flat. Shouting through the letterbox, like Leanne stuff was shouting through the letterbox, no response. But I know that Nikki was very down and depressed about her mum being poorly and she was really worried about what was going to happen to her. And sometimes Nikki was the type of person that does need to be just left alone for a little while. It's very unusual for her not to contact people. So I thought, you know what, we'll give it a night. But the next day, there is still no word from Nikki. She's usually very reliable. Her family trust her, they rely on her. So they're concerned. Her half-sister obtains a spare key to her flat and goes round with other members of the family. With Nikki not responding, her family let themselves into the flat. But nothing could prepare them for what they would find. They walk into the kitchen and in front of them, they saw Nikki on the floor in a pool of blood, her left wrist had been slit. They found Nikki laying on the floor, her face up with, um, there was just like a massive congealed blood running from Nikki's head. And um, yeah, you could see that she was dead. Family members went down to her flat to see if she was okay and obviously discovered her body. At that point, they immediately called the police. My daughter phoned me up hysterical, saying, Nikki's dead, Nikki's dead, uh, there's blood everywhere. And uh, I just went hysterical on the phone, and then I was in shock. Police immediately arrive on the scene. 
to be met by a gruesome sight. In this case, the scene investigation officer will be looking to preserve that scene, preserving and securing evidence. Nikki is laying on the floor of her kitchen, fragments of a ceramic chicken-shaped pot surrounding her. A severe cut is across her wrist. Could she have had an accident or taken her own life? It was so bizarre and there didn't seem to be any particular reason for it. It was suspected that Nikki had took her own life, but I knew that that wasn't the case. She'd never done that. She loved life too much. She would never have left her mum and her family. As Nikki's body is taken for a post-mortem, the tragic news travels fast through the close-knit community, alerting the local press to the scene. When the police arrived, the area was cordoned off. There were police cars everywhere. Officers in white suits from the forensic department carrying out checks. Local people at the shops and, and, and the flats were, were shot by what had gone on. It's not something you hear about in, you know, the area that you live. It's not something you expect on your doorstep. She was so friendly with everybody around here. It was sad when we heard about what happened to her. She wouldn't hurt anybody. She was the most kindest person I'd ever known. It was devastating news. When the post-mortem report comes in, the results are not clear-cut. From the pathology reports, there's no one single injury that led to Nikki's death. It was inconclusive. But the results do reveal Nikki's skull had been fractured. And it seems the broken ceramic chicken-shaped dish which had surrounded her body was involved. So the pathologist said that um, the chicken dish would have been picked up by two hands and used with considerable force. Although it wasn't enough to fracture Nikki's skull, it was certainly was enough to render her unconscious. The police quickly realised that somebody else had been involved. The pathologists have concluded that she died because of the violent actions of a third party. No one could have predicted that this was going to happen. We just couldn't believe it. It was just so, it was like it wasn't even happening to us. With the outcome from the post-mortem now in, the inquiry into Nikki's death changes focus. She's been murdered. In Letchworth, results from the post-mortem on 26-year-old Nikki Collingbourne has changed the course of the investigation. They walked into the kitchen and in front of them, they saw Nikki on the floor in a pool of blood. Her left wrist had been slit. Chicken dish would have been picked up by two hands and used with considerable force. It was certainly was enough to render her unconscious. With a murder investigation now underway, police break the news to her grieving family. I was at work. Um, I got a phone call from my boyfriend at the time and he just said, you need to get home right now. He goes, I can't really tell you anything. I don't want to tell you right now. Uh, but I knew. And I, I was so panicky. When I got there, it was there was police everywhere. It was, yeah, not very good. And my, my children were there crying. Uh, my mum was there crying. And I was like, murder? What, what do you mean, murder? I honestly didn't think, even in that moment, that it was murder. Just unbelievable. It's like you're, you're in a movie. It's not even happening to you. Yeah, everyone was just shocked, devastated. News that Nikki's death is now being treated as a murder quickly spreads around the area. When I first heard about the murder, I think it was just generally shock because you don't expect that to sort of happen where you, where you live. I was really amazed, really surprised. It's a really safe area and 
it really shocked me. It took a long, long time to, to, to take it in. And we knew the relatives who knew them and so sorry for the family, you know. With family and locals still trying to come to terms with the murder, the bigger question being asked is who would want to harm Nikki? She works with children. Um, that was just what she wanted to do for her whole life. Um, just work with children, be a mum, and, you know, she had a great relationship with everyone. I loved everything about Nikki. Everything. She was just... Just a beautiful person. There's nothing she wouldn't do for you. She'd cheer you up. She'd get you motivated, because I don't go out a lot. She'd come in, she'd do stuff for me. She's like a little... Like the little sister I never had. Her family was her life. And, um, yeah, we saw her almost all the time. I'd open my door, my son would be gone into her house and I wouldn't see him for days. <laughs> Just to text her to make sure, is my son OK? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you don't need to worry, he's here. She literally brought so much joy to anybody that met her, really. She just kept us all together. She was a glue that kept both sides of the family together, really. She was just a really amazing... Well, one of those people that you meet and you're like, wow, she's just, she was put on this earth just to care for people. She was just amazing. I was honestly shocked uh, when I found out who the victim was. So I honestly had no idea why anybody would want to, uh, to harm her. With no clues as to who would want to harm Nikki, forensic officers take a closer look at her flat, turning the block into a major crime scene. Police officers in white suits were gathering vital forensic evidence. The whole scene had been cordoned off. It was a major crime in what was usually a quiet area. A murderer will either leave something at the scene or take something away from the scene. So we're looking to preserve and, and secure that evidence. And that evidence will be DNA, uh, fingerprints, blood, hair, fibres, etc. So that they're looking uh, for the physical evidence. A forensic examination of the scene was, was carried out and DNA, um, essentially blood, uh, was found on the broken pieces of the chicken pot. While the evidence is sent off to the laboratory for examination, further searching at Nikki's home uncovers something concerning. A letter was found in Nikki's flat in which she'd written to her GP saying she was absolutely terrified. The letter throws up more questions. Who could Nikki have been afraid of? And could this person be behind her untimely death? Nikki unfortunately got a lot of threats and um, it, Nikki was terrified. I've never, ever known anyone so ter absolutely terrified. I remember one night she barricaded her door up. Yeah, she was very withdrawn. Um, she was just scared. Police need to piece together Nikki's last known movements, including trying to ascertain whether anyone visited her. There was no sign of a forced entry. Um, in the sense of, for example, the door having been levered or a broken window or anything of that kind. The only way that you could get to it, it was quite secure, was by entering the door to the common parts of the purpose-built block and then going up the stairs and onto the landing and approaching the door of um, Nicky's flat. So when looking at a murder investigation, the priorities at the scene could be different for different murders. Um, for example, a killer has to have got there and then gone away from the scene. So it, it could be uh, fast track looking at the CCTV, it could be speaking to family members, or it could be house to house because somebody could have seen the killer uh, leaving the scene. All at the entrance, and the landing on the first floor were covered by CCTV cameras. And as it happens, the system had been recently improved. And once the police got access to the CCTV, they recovered 
whole series of images of events occurring at the door of the flat between the Sunday evening when Nicky returned home and the uh, Tuesday evening when members of her, fam- of her family finally let themselves in. After accessing the CCTV footage, police spend hours trawling through the images. When the police reviewed the CCTV footage, they saw a person entering the flats. That person uh, was wearing a high-vis jacket. The CCTV shows a figure in a ginger curly wig, large frame glasses, with a King Charles I beard and a high-vis jacket lumbering along the corridor. The person is seen entering the flats just before 8.30 a.m. on Monday the 23rd of May and leaving just before noon, corresponding with the pathologist's time of death. That person immediately becomes a person of interest because of the time they entered and left the flats. But also the CCTV showed that um, that person went to Nikki's door. Who is the person on CCTV wearing a high-vis? Could it be a workman? or a boyfriend. When you've got the CCTV, you don't know who that is. However, you look into the victim and their background, and if you find out how a victim lived, you may find out how they died. She she didn't have boyfriends, she was waiting for that one special person. With police still at a loss, they turned to those close to Nikki. The police called, called me up and asked me to go into the station to help them with something. But after I got off the phone to them, I was like a bit like, well, I was the last person to see Nikki. All these thoughts were, you don't even think you're going to think like that, but all these thoughts were running through my mind. I thought, I was the last person to see her, I was the last person to talk to her. What if they think it was me? Me and Jodie had been called up on the Thursday or Friday by the police uh, at the headquarters in Welling, and they said, oh, would you, you and Jodie, we want just you and Jodie to come and view some pictures for us. And we were like, oh, okay. And we were like, well, we don't really know anyone around here. We only know our family, so I don't know what we're gonna find. Like, we just didn't know what we was gonna expect. It's me and obviously Leanne drove there. And uh, we got there and they separated us both. And they basically took Leanne into a room. And then I um, took me into a room and I didn't quite know what I was here to do. And they just like, we need to show you some CCTV images. Um, just say what you think, if you know the person, say. And we kind of sat in this room and had a camera on us, I filmed filmed the whole thing of me watching video footage of someone in a high-vis. I honestly felt like passing out when I see it, like within three seconds of watching the clip. I actually had to stop halfway through watching it. I was in such shock. I was crying, screaming, I couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, I don't even think that's a man. I think, um, I think that's a female dressing up as a man. I knew straight away that Jodie was going to identify her. I just knew that it was a one. The murder investigation into the death of Nikki Collingbourne has thrown up a suspect. A man seen entering Nikki's flat at the time of her death. But when CCTV is examined closely, family members recognize the person. And it's not a man. When I see that first image of her her dressed up the way she was, it just all hit me. just knew that it was Yvonne. But who is Yvonne? So Nikki and Yvonne were sisters. Uh, There's a big age gap between about 27 years. I first met Yvonne when I was dating her brother Paul, who obviously I later married, and uh, we became friends. We used to go to the pub. Yvonne went to live in America and basically I didn't have anything to do with Yvonne for years. She was estranged from the family. 
Having moved to the US in the early 1990s, and due to their age gap, Yvonne and Nikki had not grown up together. But keen to get to know her half-sister, Nikki moved to America. I did meet her when I went to America um, a couple of times. I kind of had my reservations about her, and uh, she's quite in your face when she talks. She makes everything about her. Um, she's quite manipulative. She was quite boisterous. She would certainly punch you if um, she wouldn't think twice about it. Despite the family's reservations, in 2015, when Yvonne came to visit family in the UK from the US, Nikki repaid the favour, letting her sister move in with her. Everyone was just shocked to see her back in the UK, but at first we were happy to see her because she's part of family. The pair living together came as a surprise to family, since Nikki had shared something with them on her return to the UK. Yvonne and Nikki's relationship was very strained when she came back because they'd had a big fallout before Nikki came back. And then obviously Yvonne followed about, I think it was a year later, but Nikki forgave her and they, they made it up. And that's how she ended up living with Nikki. With Yvonne Kayla having been identified as the person in the CCTV and with her being deemed the last person to see Nikki and therefore a suspect, Police need to ascertain what could have gone wrong in their relationship. I have no doubt in my mind that Avon was jealous of Nikki and their relationship that she had over the years with their dad. Avon was very jealous of the relationship that Nikki had with their dad because she obviously lived in America and Nikki lived in England and she grew up with her dad and I suppose you know, she was in with all of us lot, and Yvonne didn't have that relationship with us. We only had that over the internet. So obviously Nikki felt obliged to, to have Yvonne there because they were, they were sisters, and Nikki was a very much a family person. Yvonne definitely, definitely manipulated her and used the fact that they were sisters. Nikki and Yvonne Kayla's relationship was anything other than tranquil. It was difficult and tempestuous. But could this strained relationship between the half-sisters have led to Nikki's death? In order to piece the puzzle together, police need to ask some questions. So make a decision. Von Kayla was arrested on the 25th of May, 2016. Once we've got the suspect in custody, and we believe that is the killer, um, the clock is ticking. So we've got to do everything we can to gain get enough evidence for the CPS to authorise a charge. Um, because certainly in this case, if Yvonne Kayla had been bailed, uh, she was a risk to other people out there. Because obviously they had Yvonne, they'd arrested her for Nikki's murder, but they had no evidence to hold her had this CCTV image and DNA takes time to come back so they couldn't actually hold her. With Yvonne in custody, police trawl her mobile phone and laptop and discover she had been searching for flights. The police discovered she was planning to drive to Spain and then fly out to the United States to meet her husband. She was planning to flee the jurisdiction and fly back to America. Those arrangements had, as it were, begun in the immediate aftermath of uh, Nikki Collingbourne's death. She was a flight risk. We know she was planning to go back to the USA. Her mobile phone revealed she'd even sent messages after news of Nikki's murder broke. Yvonne Kayla was pretending to be as concerned and upset as every other member of Nikki's family. She sent a message to her husband in the United States saying, pray for Nikki as I will. While piecing together Yvonne's movements in the days leading up to Nikki's murder, further revelations come to light. She had visited the costume shop where she acquired the wig and the disguise and the false beard the preceding week. 
So there'd been clearly an element of planning about all of this. We believe she's planned this murder meticulously, so she's a, an extreme danger to the public out there. Police build their evidence against Yvonne Kayla. But at this stage, it's purely circumstantial. So the focus turns to questioning Yvonne while in custody. Yvonne, do you recognise the person in that CCTV? Uh -huh. Look, both legged, fat, both legged to me. Even though it could be clear that the person on the CCTV is Yvonne, uh, Yvonne is denying that that is her, and that is not enough on its own to convict somebody of murder. It was almost like it was a joke. Like, she had padded herself up with some sort of padding, and she had a high vis on, a moustache that looked like she'd bought in a joke shop, a wig and a goatee. And it was the most surreal... I can't to this day even look at it. Like, I literally can't believe the way she dressed up and how she thought she was going to get away with that because you can clearly see that that is her. When I heard that Yvonne had dressed up to get into the flat, I, I was just gobsmacked. Never have even thought of anything like that. Well, I couldn't tell if it was fake beers. <laughs> Do you own fake beers? No, I don't own a fake beers. Do you own a fake wig? No, I don't own a fake wig. By denying her presence on the CCTV, Yvonne was trying to achieve the smoke and mirrors that she'd, um, that, uh, of her plan. Uh, she wanted the police to believe that this was a man. And in fact, in a police interview, she tells the police officer that she thought it was a man who was bow-legged. Again, this was just part of her, her, her callous plan. I'm not fat, but I'm not bow-legged. I look like a man to me. I couldn't see his face. What does he look like a man? Like then there is a breakthrough in the case. Results have come back from the forensic lab which had been analysing the blood found on the broken chicken pot. The breaking of the casserole pot at the moment that it was used to strike her had quite clearly cut the hands of the person who was holding it at the time because on some of those ceramic pieces were found blood, the DNA of which did not match Nikki Collingborn, but which did match that of Yvonne Kayla. I knew in my mind, Yvonne has murdered Nikki. I just knew. Yvonne Kayla was quickly charged with murder. Well, of course Why would you. you think that's me? Because to me, it looks like the person's wearing a wig and a beard. I don't know about a wig, but they look like they had a beard. We suspect that person He's has mate. murdered your sister. Well, it ain't me, cos I ain't gonna be out pushing on that door like that. Yeah, you said we believe it's you, you said it's, it's not you. I know, you can't believe you think it's me. Having been charged with the murder of Nikki Collingborn, Yvonne Kayla maintains her innocence, but is remanded in custody until a trial date is set. Nikki's body is released, so she can finally be laid to rest. Nikki was loved by so many people. Um, at a funeral, there were so many people there that obviously I knew, and so many people had travelled from all over to come to her funeral. They'd all bought pictures of her, like, at the nursery with the kids, and they all put it on a big board, and it was, it was lovely. But the funeral brings more devastating news for the family. Nikki's mum, Rena, it destroyed her. She was like, she died, did it like a day before the funeral. She didn't even get to bury it or that. With overwhelming evidence stacking against her, Yvonne Kayla has been charged with the murder of Nikki Collingborn. Having pleaded not guilty, Kayla's trial begins at Luton Crown Court. The main issue in the case was the identity of the person who had been captured on the CCTV forcing their way in. Because Yvonne Kayla's defence to the charge of murder was a perfectly simple one, 
it was, it wasn't me and I was elsewhere at the time. As the case opens, Nikki's family take to the stand. I think I was one of the first people to give evidence. Um, so I couldn't actually go and sit in the gallery until I'd given my evidence. Um, I just remember when I did go in, the, obviously the very first person I did see was, was Yvonne. She was just smirking, um, trying to make me feel uncomfortable. And they reveal a major fallout between Nikki and her half-sister Yvonne when the latter came to the UK to visit family for a few months. Yvonne had been at Nikki's for a few months. Um, they'd had a few bad days, a couple of little rows, and either Yvonne or Nikki would end up in my mum's house, which is where we resided at the time. And, you know, we could kind of see the tension, you know, getting a bit more. So I think they lived together for a very short length of time, like five months. But in that five months, a lot happened. Like, a lot happened. Yvonne was literally trying to... She was trying to manipulate Nikki into doing everything for her. It was like she was using, she was using Nikki, basically. She was just using her. So when Nikki told us that she was going to evict Yvonne, um, we were just, we were ecstatic really because Nikki had been in a bit of a state for a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit longer. Tension arose between them whilst they were living in the flat and Nikki Collingbourne asked her to leave. On the day of her departure, uh, there was unpleasantness between them and Yvonne Kayla made a complaint to the police that Nikki Collingbourne had assaulted her. And the police came to the flat and they arrested Nikki Collingbourne and she was taken to a local police station. But having interviewed her, it wasn't long before I think they realised that their uh, wasn't any substance to the complaint and she was released from custody, allowed to go home and in fact nothing further was ever done in respect of that complaint. But whilst Nikki was busy explaining herself to local police, it seems Yvonne was taking her revenge for being evicted. While Nikki was being questioned, uh, Yvonne paid a locksmith to break in basically she proved that she'd lived there because obviously she had paperwork to say that that was her address but obviously she was not on the tenancy and um so the locksmith like he had no idea because she was very manipulative she just pulls the wall out of everyone's eyes whilst nikki was in custody with the police yvonne stole loads of stuff once inside Nikki's flat, it seemed Yvonne stole some of her half-sister's belongings, something Nikki discovered when she arrived home. Well, she uh, immediately reported what had taken place to the police, uh, that her sister had let herself in to what was Nikki's home um, without permission. And Yvonne Kayla was arrested as a result of that complaint. But Yvonne seemed determined to wheedle her way out of trouble. Yvonne Kayla was now in big trouble. She was facing a burglary charge and a trial at the Crown Court. She approached Nikki's ill, elderly mother in an attempt to persuade her to say that the property that she'd taken belonged to her. She was subsequently charged with offences of burglary and doing acts tending and intended to pervert the course of justice. And that those proceedings, um, that case was due to be tried uh, at the Crown Court at Cambridge. While awaiting her day in court for burglary, Yvonne was released on bail on the condition she didn't contact Nikki. She breached those conditions. She would phone her up, try and make contact with her, and did so in such a way as to cause considerable alarm to Nikki. Nikki was certainly living in fear of Yvonne uh, due to the burglary and perversing the course of justice. 
I think she was just hoping that Yvonne would get on a plane and go back to America um, and just leave her in peace because wherever she went, she was always looking over her shoulder and, um, yeah, he wasn't very nice for her to see her like that. She'd gone completely within herself. It's not bubbly anymore. Yvonne's trial for burglary and perverting the course of justice was listed for May 23rd. Her half-sister, Nikki, was due to give evidence against her. Something which police believe made Yvonne carry out her deadly plan. Yvonne Kayla is a very controlling and manipulative person. Um, she likes to be in control. However, once she's charged with burglary and perverting the course of justice, the court process is out of her control. So to try and wrestle that uh, control back, she's been very, very callous in planning and executing the murder of her stepsister. The court hears how on the day she was due to stand trial for burglary, Yvonne donned her disguise and entered the flats where Nikki lived, approaching her door. Then this shocking scene of the door being opened and what we surmised from the way that she was dressed and the towel and the half full bath is that Nikki had been in the bathroom with a towel wrapped round her with just her underwear on. She was preparing to have a morning bath. She heard the doorbell go. She opened the door and as she recognised it was her sister, she would have been really frightened and shocked at the realisation of seeing that, although it was her sister, her sister was disguised in this bizarre way and I think she would immediately have known that, that she was in really serious danger. And there was a struggle at the door. And as you watched it, there were those, that awful couple of seconds where it looked as though she was just about to get the door shut before finally the, it was forced open and Yvonne Kayla went in and then the door shut behind her. And then two hours of nothing. Once inside the flat, the prosecution claims Yvonne and Nikki argued in the kitchen and as Nikki turned to walk away, Yvonne attacked her. The chicken dish would have been picked up by two hands and used with considerable force and uh, Nikki would have been walking away from that. Certainly was enough to render her unconscious. Then Yvonne panicked and tried to stage the scene. There's been an attempt made to make this look like a suicide. Um, so there was injuries to Nikki's wrist to make it look like she'd uh, self-harmed. Um, there was also a big tidy up of the flat, and in including the staging of a placing a dustpan brush in Nikki's left hand. Having tried to make it look as though Nikki had cut herself on the broken pot and bled to death while trying to clear it up, Yvonne is once again caught on CCTV, leaving the flat. She was carrying some plastic bags that she hadn't had with her when she arrived, so she clearly had some uh, property in the bags. Um, one of the things which we consider she did when she left and which was in the bag were some of the remnants from the casserole pot that had been used because one of the things the police did was they put it all back together again. It was like a 3D jigsaw. But what it demonstrated once they'd done it was that there were a number of the pieces missing. We surmised that she'd realized that there was her blood on the broken pieces and she had taken those which she could find with blood stains on them in the plastic carrier bag. But unfortunately for her, unfortunately for us, she left a couple behind. When Yvonne Kayla was shown the CCTV footage, um, her reaction was one of denial. Yvonne, do you recognise the person in that CCTV? Uh -huh, look, bow legged, fat, bow legged to me. I'm fat, but I'm not bow legged. I look like a man to me. But I couldn't see his face. As the trial progresses, Yvonne continues to deny her involvement. Then the prosecution calls a new witness. Actually, the worst moment thinking about it through the trial was when they brought prisoner to give evidence against 
Yvonne. We found out that there was a prisoner that Yvonne had spent some time with uh, while she was on remand. She was going to be released quite soon. She decided to draw a map of my flat uh, and try and bribe a prisoner that was being released to set fire to my flat, knowing that my daughter was living here at the time with my two grandchildren. She had this idea that if she gave her um, some of her DNA, I think it was blood, or on a cotton bud or something, that she could leave the evidence there and uh, set fire to it and say, well, someone's trying to frame me because how would my blood be at a scene when um, I'm in prison? So someone's obviously framed me for the murder of Nikki. But Yvonne's bizarre plan to try to suggest she had been set up for the murder didn't sway the jury. With all the facts presented to them, including the CCTV footage and the DNA evidence, the jury retires to consider its verdict. So at one point in the trial, I honestly thought it was going to go the other way. It was like almost like her defence was like making it kind of out like she couldn't have possibly done this. And, and like honestly, we honestly thought at one point, maybe she's going to get away with this. Honestly, it's a really scary feeling. Even though we knew all the evidence was there, it's convincing that jury that she did that. On December the 19th, 2016, Yvonne Kayla is found guilty of murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. Yvonne Kayla could have accepted the burglary charges or gone to trial on the burglary charges and let the jury decide, um, but she decided not to. She, did, she hatched a plan, cold, calculated, and she killed Nikki Collinborn rather than face a trial for burglary. When the guilty verdict was read out, I think there was the biggest sigh of relief to know that she was going to be locked up and that we would just never have to have anything to do with her ever again and that we could then tell our children that this bad person is now in prison and she can't touch any of us anymore. After Nikki passed away, people would like come up to me and say how sorry they were, and they'd always have a memory of her, them, her helping them in some way. Like she would literally go out of her way to help people. She loved to make people happy, and that's what Nikki lived for. Because seeing other people happy made her happy. Like, I can't explain. She was just, she was just such a gentle soul. came in, it seemed an unlikely town and an unlikely venue for this sort of thing to happen at a joinery shop, after tea, when you wouldn't expect people to be working. Things just didn't seem quite right. Everybody was really quite worried. You know, it could have been the person that you walked past in the street, it could have been anybody. I don't know how anybody could live with it, knowing that they burnt somebody alive. Everybody was so shocked and everybody was, was locking up more and feeling a bit worried about it all because nothing like this had ever happened in the village. A few miles from the bustling seaside resort of Skegness sits the small, picturesque market town of Borilamage, affectionately known by its residents as the village. Everybody here calls it a village because we, we feel like village people. We're so connected and, and so we help one another. Borough La Marche is a typical Lincolnshire village on the edge of the Lincolnshire Wolds, famous for its windmill where people are hard working and just get on with their lives. 
I've had a salon in Borough La Marche for 14, 15 years and it's a lovely, quiet village where everybody knows everybody. They got everybody gets on with everybody and my clients are lovely. But the peaceful tranquility of the village is about to go up in flames. We've just gone up to the workshop to, to pick some things out. Yeah. And somebody came and put us behind. Yeah. And they, 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 they tagged us and set fire to the place. The workshop on fire belongs to well-known local couple, David Twig and Julie Dixon, who own a joinery business next to their home. As the emergency call comes in, Lincolnshire Fire and Rescue Station Commander Gary Milson is immediately dispatched to the scene. Once I've received the call, I'd be straight into my car and, uh, and making headway down to Brawler Marsh. It's only a few miles down the road. There's not a lot of time to, uh, to mull over things and, and get other information in. The information that was relayed to me at that point was that two men dressed in black and wearing balaclavas had accosted uh, David Twig and, uh, and his partner. Uh, they dropped David into the storeroom and then proceeded to pour petrol into the foyer of the building uh, and lit it before fleeing the scene. As I approached the premise, there was a white picket fence surrounding it. It seemed quite surreal, the appliances at the bottom with, with the lights on. As I walked past that towards the entrance where the activity was taking place, uh, the incident commander gave me a, a quick brief and said that uh, there was very little fire and the fire was out and they was now trying to locate Davy Twig, who they'd been informed was locked in a, a room inside the building. With the blaze having been brought under control and extinguished, Gary and his team desperately try to locate David Twig. The workshops were an old railway buildings. They were long and thin. And at the end, there was a small area with a, with a kitchen, a storeroom, and a toilet, uh, and a small foyer that linked these all together. And they were all involved in the fire. They was all black uh, and heated and sooty, but they were all empty apart from the storeroom door that was locked. There was no keys present. The decision was made that the wall might be easier to break through than the door and a hole was made in the wall and we could see that there was somebody that, who appeared to be on the knees facing the door. We tried to rouse them uh, through shouting and speaking to them but there was no response. With David not responding, the urgency to reach him grows and the fire crew break deeper into the wall, releasing the door. As the door opened, um, Davy Twig fell forward into our arms and forward, forward onto the floor. The crews immediately turned him over and, uh, and began resuscitation. We had an ambulance already in attendance and the paramedics were very quickly there and uh, we, we assisted the paramedics in, uh, in placing him uh, into the ambulance where they could work on him further. In the back of the ambulance, paramedics battle to resuscitate David Twig. The time frame from, from the call to us getting Dave, David out of the cupboard may have been around about 10 to 15 minutes and then, then we worked, worked on him for a, probably another 15, 20 minutes after that before the, uh, the paramedics uh, decided to, uh, to call time and, uh, and pronounce him dead. With David dead, the situation immediately changes and a murder investigation is launched. The first information I got was that there'd been a fire um, at a business premises uh, near Skegness in Lincolnshire, of course, um, and that two men had been involved. They'd made off um, where they hadn't been found at the moment. A man had tragically died, um, believed to be the owner of the business, uh, and his partner, who worked with him, a lady, um, had been quite badly injured in the incident. Um, she was being taken to hospital to be treated uh, and officers were at the scene. Also lots of things going through your mind, but at no stage anything other than, you know, this is a murder case, uh, it's tragic, that David Twig has died and we need to find these two people as soon as possible. With fire crews, police and paramedics at the scene, it isn't long before news of the tragedy spreads around the town. It was a big event for Lincolnshire. Um, 
a robbery homicide in a small village like Borilla Marsh is something that had never happened before um, in my 25 years covering the area. Um, and it may well never happen again. Rumours I heard was they were looking for two men. And my house faces a back field. And of course, the drones was going over there. Uh, there, w there was quite some noise and, and I, didn't, I couldn't believe it, actually. The whole village was stunned that something could have happened on the doorsteps. It was big news and everybody was really quite worried that whoever did it could have been out there and they could have been next. You just don't know. There was a lot of anxiety in the community. Um, Borough Marsh is a, a long way from the nearest police station, a long way sometimes from the nearest police officer. And local people were obviously very concerned that they may be the victim of a similar burglary. In the Lincolnshire town of Borilla Marsh, police have launched a murder investigation after local joiner David Twig was pronounced dead following a fire at his workshop. His partner, Julie Dixon, had managed to escape and call 999, reporting that masked intruders had broken in, locked David in the storeroom, and set the place on fire. The impact on the local community after this happened was immense. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, I was clearly getting phone calls. The local community officers were being stopped in the street. People were going to the police station. There was a kind of sense of not just why has this happened, but, but who's responsible? And, and just as importantly, is it going to happen again? Is somebody else going to be you know, the target of these two individuals? And nobody could think of a reason why David and Julie would be targeted. David Twig was a only son. Um, he grew up in the area. His parents remained in the area. Um, he was a master joiner, very popular and a hard-working man in the local area. Um, he was also a very big man, um, well over six feet tall and 19 stone, but he, he was a presence in the community. David met Julie in 1996 when she was going through a divorce. The pair quickly moved in together. They remained together for 15 years. Um, they came across as a, as a, as a typical middle-aged couple. In Borough La Marche, um, David and Julie were seen as a team. Um, David was the carpenter, the joiner um, at the business, and Julie was the doing the finance and the accounts for the business. Outside of joinery, David soon discovered a new hobby, stock car racing which opened up a whole new social circle for him and Julie, with professional racer John Mickle and his wife Lisa. So from that very first race meeting, really kind of just kicked it off. Uh, we enjoyed each other's company. They wanted to come to every single race meeting. They wanted to be involved. And David soon found a way to combine work with his newfound love when he set up a sideline alongside his joinery company. As David's business grew, um, he was quite happy to sponsor the motor racing team. That was one of, his pa one of his passions. And so they undertook that deal, which was several thousand pounds. Julie and David were keen to promote this new Kitchen Bits and Bobs business, which is an online business that they were trying to get off the ground. Uh, I think they felt that probably some branding on the race cars. Um, and then obviously we can promote it through social media as well. The sponsorship proved very successful. David particularly got on very well with the racing team and they were invited over to America to watch the team racing and all seemed well. It was a very happy relationship and he got on very well with them. I think from the beam on his face when we first you know, agreed at Lydon Hill, he just seemed incredibly proud. He seemed very smiley. And you could tell he was passionate about his business and this was something that he felt was going to enhance um, the, the people that would, would see his work. The friendship between the two couples started to grow stronger. I think from the very first time we met them, I really, really liked what they brought to the team and, you know, 
the energy um, and we just, we call it a race family and it just felt like they were going to become part of our race family. Julie wanted to be hands-on with me in the kitchen um, while David was very quick to throw himself into the deep end with John on the mechanic side as well. They just got stuck in. It wasn't just about the racing anymore. Um, they started to get quite involved. Um, she wanted to be involved in, in the family life that we had as well. Um, she would buy presents for my children who were aged four and seven then. Um, you know, they looked fondly upon her and David as well. So they became family friends. And it was Lisa Julie turned to in the aftermath of the tragedy of David's death. The very first time I heard about David was on Monday morning. I had a phone call somewhere between 7 and 7.30 in the morning from Julie. She basically was hysterical. She was shouting down the phone, he's dead, he's dead. And I really didn't have a clue what she was even talking about. I didn't know who's dead. I said, Julie, who's dead? She said, David, David's dead. Um, and I then tried to get some more information. You know, what's happened? She said, a fire, a fire. So none of her sentences were very long. It was just words being thrown out at me. Um, I said, a fire, what, you, there's a house fire? She said, no, workshop, fire, um, masked men, uh, attacked. But from that phone call, I immediately knew I had to go and visit her straight away. I knew it would be a long journey up to Lincolnshire, probably four hours. I just grabbed my purse, my keys and left. So the four hours going there was, uh, it's a very weird and surreal situation. You keep thinking, you know, has this really happened? Is this some kind of, you know, is this true? Is it real? I, I, I just can't get my head around it. It's an awful lot of information. Hearing her so upset on the phone and those words, he's dead, they just kept playing and playing in my head. When Lisa arrives at Julie's parents' house, she finds Julie in a state of shock. Uh, Julie was sitting and rocking in a chair. I was absolutely taken back when I first saw her because she had burns on her face. She told me that her and David on the Sunday had gone down to the yard, which is just a, a short stroll from the house, to lock up. That's all they were doing. They were going to lock up. She said that she had asked David to go into the storeroom to get a light bulb um, and these two men wearing balaclavas, dressed in black and hoodies, had come into the barn, had locked David in the cupboard and then had grabbed her and that they had tried and forced her towards this circular saw. Um, I asked her how she got away and she said, I just squirmed out of, she said, lucky I was wearing a hoodie. I squirmed out of it and ran. She said she ran out of the door, she ran across the field um, and then I think after a short space of time, she turned around to look back to see that these intruders were also leaving the premises, that they'd shut the door behind them. She was then concerned about David, so she went back to the barn. And when she opened the door, suddenly the combustion, the flames, that's what had caused the burns to her face. While Lisa consoles her heartbroken friend, police turn up to interview Julie as a key witness to the crime. She was only able to, to give um, some basic details. Um, we didn't want to push too hard, of course. She's a victim, she's lost David in the most awful circumstances. Clearly the 999 call provided us with a little bit of information, which was helpful, but we wanted to try and dig deeper if we could. Um, so we had to ask those difficult questions as early as possible. She was interviewed by specially trained officers, but sometimes it just wasn't possible to continue with interviews because um, Julie wasn't in an uh, emotionally fit state to, to carry on at that point. So we had to do lots of short sections rather than a, a really long and, and draining and demanding interview. With little information gleaned from Julie and an ease growing among the locals, police turned to the public for help. In the hours that followed, Lincolnshire Police 
made appeals for the intruders and did reveal that a 99 call, 999 call had been made by Julie Dixon uh, and gave the description of these two masked men who had been to the workshop and that Julie had managed to push one of them away and escape and then rang the fire brigade on 999. Uh, I remember holding more than one press conference, which wasn't just local and regional, it was national as well, because this was big news in terms of you know, what had happened and, and where it had happened and the type of community that it was affecting. As Lincolnshire Police continued to make these appeals, we would take that information and circulate it amongst the various radio stations, local newspapers, daily newspapers in Lincolnshire. And the police were obviously very anxious to get that, that message out as wide as possible. With Lincolnshire police desperately trying to piece together the events of the night and establish the identity of the masked men, Fire Commander Gary Milson scours the crime scene for clues. Once the fire's been extinguished, we then start on the scene preservation side of it. And as we withdraw from the, from the building, we're trying to make sure that anything that has been removed out of the building is, is logged or is placed back into the building with care so that should we need to, we can rebuild that picture, that jigsaw puzzle to help us find out how the fire started. I've dealt with quite a few fires and unfortunately fatal fires as well and murder cases and it's probably one of the most challenging cases that you have to deal with because by its very nature fire destroys and fire destroys evidence, not just the fire itself but the, the water that's used. Having established petrol was used as the accelerant, senior investigating officer Stuart Gibbon begins trying to make sense of the scene. All uh, police officers and detectives are um, constantly reminded about how important the golden hour is. Um, it's a time where you can lose evidence, um, but if you get it right and you gather the evidence and you secure and preserve that evidence, it can have a positive impact on the, on the rest of the investigation. The gold now in this particular investigation was kind of twofold. One was about securing the workshop to make sure that we could get access to it and that nobody else used it. And it could be forensically examined over a period of days, which it was. Um, also, from a financial point of view, it wasn't going to be a kind of random attack. It did, that is something that I almost, um, almost eliminated from a very early stage, simply because of where it is. So was it a customer that had been in before? And then you start to think about the, you know, the reasons why. Is it financial? Um, is it a robbery or a burglary that's gone wrong? D did David um, owe somebody some money and they were trying to recover the money? So we, we drafted in a financial investigator working with the police um, and he was starting to look at the actual uh, basics of the business, you know, um, how it was doing financially, what was going on. Could David have been targeted for money? Was it a revenge attack for a business deal gone wrong? Or something closer to home? So, Julie did actually send me a few messages and she called me quite distressed, probably a couple of weeks before David was killed. Um, she did say that her telephone had been cut off, but then was restored again. She said that her electricity had been cut off, but restored again. She felt that someone was messing around with them. Aware that this information could be key to the investigation, Lisa contacts the police. So we had a, what are known as a Pulsar team, police search advisor team, specialist search officers that, that did a kind of fingertip search in the parameters around the building. And actually they found something which appeared quite significant, um, deposited in some bushes on a neighbouring um, piece of land next to the joinery workshop they found some keys and we were able to establish uh, at a slightly later point that one of those keys fitted the storeroom that David had been locked inside. So this is quite a significant find for us. Obviously those items were forensically examined, they didn't yield any evidence, but the finding of those keys um, supported at that point the account that Julie Dixon had given because they were found in the direction that the two offenders were um, alleged to have gone off in. Further inquiries begin to yield some surprising discoveries. I think the first kind of uh, breakthrough in terms of new information for the investigation wasn't surprisingly to do with the two offenders. It was to do with the financial um, affairs, if you like. 
we'd been led to believe by the inquiries that we conducted that the business was in a good place financially, um, that David was doing well and, and that and the accounts were healthy. In actual fact, when we had a financial investigator start to look more closely at the accounts and the business, uh, the opposite was true. They were in dire financial straits, on the verge, if not already, bankrupt, and there were some serious financial issues. Having been unaware of the financial issues at David's business, further inquiries throw up more concerns. The post that was going to the business was supposed to be going to um, David Tweed Drawing, who actually had been redirected to this garage. And that was quite a big point for us as well, because that, then that begs the question, well, why is the post being redirected? Who's redirecting it? And, and what lies behind that? In Lincolnshire, the investigation into the murder of David Twigg has thrown up some suspicious activity around his business. It soon became clear that both the workshop and the bungalow where they lived had been remortgaged. Finances were becoming a little bit more um, of, a, of a priority line of inquiry and, and we needed also to know why the post was being redirected to another address. We were still keeping an open mind. Um, obviously, we were still trying to establish these two mass defenders, who they were, where they were, why they'd done what they did. But, but also, these other things were starting to kind of build up in terms of the finances, first and foremost, very, very different to how we'd initially thought they were. While the investigation homes in on David's financial affairs and whether his death could be linked to a business deal, two months after his murder, David's body is released, so he can finally be laid to rest. Friend Lisa accompanies David's partner, Julie, to the funeral. That was a huge, big turning point for us. Suddenly, my gut feeling started to take over. Um, the funeral, she acted very strange for someone that was basically saying the last goodbye to a partner. She would crack jokes and quite inappropriate jokes, acting slightly inappropriately towards people. She was laughing very, very loud. Then suddenly she'd be upset. Um, it just seemed really irrational. And I felt uncomfortable. But it isn't just friends who have their concerns. Having uncovered some financial irregularities surrounding David and Julie's business, Lincolnshire police have more questions. Yeah, we were looking for answers to these questions and the only person that really could probably provide them was Julie Dixon. I was conscious that we were asking her a lot of questions and being quite direct with her when actually, on the face of it, she was a victim of the most awful circumstances. Um, but we had to ask those questions. We weren't always given the answers uh, that we were looking for. As well as the finances, police inquiries with David's creditors flag up something else. All the inquiries that we carried out with the businesses and the authorities that were dealing with this financial debt, um, nobody had ever spoken personally or otherwise with David Twigg. Every kind of communication, be it on the telephone, email, that sort of thing, was with Julie Dixon. Um, and what we also uncovered, which was really quite concerning, was that um, people were being told by Julie um, that um, David was terminally ill, that he was abroad on holiday, that he was really unable to take any calls for various different reasons. Um, and this concerned us because we couldn't corroborate this in any way. Having also discovered the post addressed to David's business was being redirected to a local garage, Stuart and his team trawl through the garage's CCTV, hoping it will reveal who is behind the redirection. Instead, they find another clue. And when we examined that CCTV, we found um, that Julie had driven there in a vehicle on the morning of the murder uh, and had filled up um, petrol cans with, with petrol at the location. And when we did challenge her um, with finding that information in the CCTV footage, uh, she told us, of, yes, I, I did go to the garage that morning. Um, we were doing some gardening and I needed to get some petrol to fill the lawnmower up. We established also that um, Julie had a Blackberry type mobile phone um, and as part of a murder investigation you, you're always looking at mobile phone data because it can tell you a lot of things and we couldn't get into it um, so clearly we asked Julie on more than one occasion 
could you please help us and, and tell us what the PIN number is so we can access this device? She was unable to do so. She, she said that she'd forgotten, she couldn't remember it. Clearly she had been using it very recently and on the day of the murder. We had evidence of that. If nobody else uses it and nobody else has changed the PIN or password, then she must know that number or that code. What's in that BlackBerry? Why won't she tell us the PIN number? We really desperately needed to get to the bottom of what had happened and, and this was the point where the investigation focus really changed. As the months tick by, friends of Julie also start to have their doubts as to what really occurred that fateful night. One race meeting that I remember very, very clearly um, was the last race meeting that she's ever come to. When we arrived there, there was a police car there. She started screaming and hitting things, shouting at the top of her voice, making some very loud noises. And I just said, Julie, talk to me. What's wrong? Why are you upset? She sat, she rocked, she cried. She rocked, she cried. And then she started saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And I just said, what are you sorry for? Tell me what you're sorry for. She rocked, she cried, I'm sorry. And it was like a repeated process. She said nothing else, she did nothing else. While Julie spends a weekend away with friends, back at the investigation, forensic evidence starts to build up. Now, the account Julie gave was that she, the two men had come in, there'd been a tussle, she'd managed to get out of the place, um, and she'd gone to ring 999, and then she'd noticed them running out, the two offenders, and they ran off round the back, and she went back in to try and rescue David or find him, and as she opened the door, there was a flashback, and she was hit with the, the, the fumes from the, from the fire and the, and the explosion, and that was how she got the injuries. Actually, forensic evidence would say otherwise, um, and would indicate that it was what's known as a vapour cloud. When the petrol would be originally poured into the foyer and lit, um, as the petrol's ignited, the vapour cloud would ignite first. And anybody in that vicinity would get caught in that vapour cloud. Uh, and depending on the, the amount of vapour and the intensity of it, they may just get slight singeing and flash burns, or they could indeed get quite badly burned. That seemed to be fitting more with the burns to Julie Dixon than rather what she was telling us that she would open the door and it flared up. In fact, we found it, we considered it quite unlikely that she had opened the door and the petrol had flared up like that. Once it's lit, it's done that initial flare up and it's unlikely that, that would happen again. There was a petrol can behind the door. Uh, had she have opened the door right at the start of the fire, she would have moved the petrol can, so that evidence didn't add up. We also recovered from a forensic examination of the bungalow some very small hairs in the, uh, in the bathroom sink. Now again, on the surface, um, first, first viewing, not particularly relevant, but when we have those sent off to be forensically examined and we find out that they belong to Julie Dixon, those hairs, again, not particularly relevant, it's her bathroom, she uses the bathroom, there are going to be hairs. Um, they were identified as, um, as uh, eyelash or eye, eyebrow hairs, eyebrow hairs, um, but they were singed, they were burned. That put a kind of different slant on it as well. Finding burned eyebrow hairs revealed Julie had gone into the bathroom after the fire had started, knowing full well her partner was trapped inside a burning building, something which raises suspicion among the police. Not only that, but the fire investigators believe Julie could only have received her injuries if she'd been inside the building when the fire started. Julie Dixon had given various different accounts. She'd given us very little information. Um, the more we tried to put to her um, by way of questions, the more withdrawn she'd become at that point um, and actually became quite defensive at various times as well. Um, and it was at that point that I made this, the decision based on all the anomalies and the significant findings. She was going to be arrested on suspicion of the murder of her partner, David. Three months after David's death, a news of Julie's arrest soon spreads around her hometown. Obviously, 
there had been a lot of anxiety and fright in the community about intruders being at large. So in some ways, the arrest of Julie put that to bed. But equally, there was also some anger um, that obviously they'd spent three months believing Julie's story. There was a lot of upset people. She had upset a lot of people because she befriended well, she was everybody's friend. She was a very likeable person. And, yeah, it was a big shock to everybody. Julie Dixon is brought into the police station for formal questioning, this time as a suspect, not as a witness. I was prepared, I thought, for most things to come from that interview, including a no-comment interview, which is quite common. Um, so we'd, we'd gathered together as a, as a group, the interviewing officers, the SIO, the interview coordinator, to discuss what could happen. Um, but what actually did happen, I think it's fair to say, threw us all at that point. She provided a prepared statement. And what it said in a nutshell was that this whole um, situation had been a suicide pact. So what she said was that both her and David had wanted to die due to the dire financial circumstances around the business and personal issues, um, and that they were preparing to do just that, um, but that when, when the crunch came to lighting the petrol and setting the fire, she panicked and ran out of the building, leaving David behind. In Lincolnshire, police are questioning David Twigg's partner on suspicion of his murder. My initial thoughts were that if Julie was prepared to, to lie about two masked raiders and, and invent a story around what had actually happened, then what else had she lied about? In interview, Julie claims the fire was a joint suicide pact, but that she had panicked and fled. So police need to establish if there is any truth in her account. Let's go back and speak to friends and family. Was What sort of state of mind was David in? And actually, fairly quickly, it was established that he was in a good state of mind. Um, he had no idea, we think, that the business was in such dire straits. He had no reason to die. There's no way that David, in his right mind, would ever would do a suicide pact because he loved life too much and he was enjoying it too much. You know, the day, the weeks before he got killed, he was down with us, enjoying it, planning the next year, the next trips, where we were going. He would never had that in his back of his mind. So we knew for ourselves then that she was bonkers and she had done it and she was now trying to get herself out of a, a murder. Suddenly, here we are, it's now a suicide pact. And who has a suicide pact but's locked behind a door that they don't have the key to? So they couldn't even change their mind if they wanted to. Poor David died on his hands and knees in a praying position leaning against a door that was locked from the outside. That's not a suicide pact. With time running out to hold Julie Dixon without charge, senior investigating officer Stuart Gibbon consults with the Crown Prosecution Service. So we clearly were very concerned about this prepared statement and just felt that it was probably another way of shifting focus. Um, you know, we've had the masked defenders, they no, no longer exist now, so now we're going to go down the suicide pact, which is, interestingly enough, is a partial defence to murder, and if found to be true, could result in a conviction for manslaughter rather than murder. So that kind of made sense at that point. Um, we had CPS working with us, so we could talk to them about the content of that prepared statement. They were already fully au okay fait with the evidence that we gathered that far. And the CPS lawyer was happy at that point that there was sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect for conviction. So the, the decision was made to charge Julie Dixon with murdering her partner, David Twigg. With Dixon charged with murder, police and CPS prepare for trial. And part of that means trying to establish a motive. Why would Julie want David dead? The main strands of evidence, really, I mean, there were quite a few bits of circumstantial as well, the petrol and the redirection of the post, but the main ones were really the finances. You know, we found out that they were in dire straits. 
What I think is that it was getting to the point where a warrant was issued for non-payment of fines. The bailiffs were going to turn up at the workshop at some point. That is the stage where David would become aware of the scale of this debt. In fact, the debt existed at all, maybe. Um, and she could, Julie Dickens could then hold that back no longer. That was where it was all going to come to a head. As well as discovering the couple were in serious financial trouble, police now had CCTV proving Julie purchased petrol on the day of the murder. But it's forensic evidence of a computer found in the couple's workshop, which really helps build the case for the prosecution. We'd heard stories that she'd been Googling stuff on a laptop, claiming that David had been Googling stuff. How do you commit suicide with it being undetected? She was Googling on her laptop how to poison someone with cakes and how to um, get away with murder. As the trial approaches, Julie Dixon changes her story yet again. Things kind of changed a little bit again um, when Julie Dixon then started to say that it wasn't a suicide pact. Actually, David, yes, David did want to die, and she was just trying to help him along, basically. Um, so she's trying to remove herself even further from any kind of blame whatsoever. You know, it was David's idea. David wanted to do it. Um, I just kind of helped him. Things had changed hugely since the first 999 call to the emergency services, but we felt we had a strong case. On the second day of that hearing, um, the not guilty plea, which had been entered initially by Julie Dixon, changed to a guilty plea, but she still maintained at that point that this had been all about David wanting to die. Um, that's what the defence was putting forward, whereas our defence was cold-blooded, premeditated, pre-planned murder. With Julie's shocking confession, the trial is halted. Once Julie Dixon had admitted her guilt and pleaded guilty to David's murder, the role of the jury was no longer needed, but then falls to the judge to decide on what basis he believes her plea and on what basis the killing was carried out. So this is what he's called the Newton hearing and the judge hears evidence from all the parties in the case and it's in the judge's role to decide how the murder was carried out effectively. The prosecution lays out its case to the judge and Julie's 999 call is played to the court. The type of them set fire to the place. So the, the place that actually set fire? Yes. Yeah. Is it the building that's on fire? It is, yes. Yeah. It is, okay then. I, I got out, I managed to get out. Right then. It is. It's okay, is everybody out of the building? No, there's still my partner in. The phone call, um, on the face of it, sounded very genuine. She sounded distraught. She was hysterical. But actually, the first information imparted was a, more of an account about what they'd been doing, uh, like a rehearsal, rather than just saying, I need help, and I need help quickly. Over five days, the court hears how Julie's account changed throughout the investigation. From masked intruders to a joint suicide pact, to her assisting David in his own bid to take his own life. The defence argued, um, once Julie Dixon had pleaded guilty, that matters had spiralled out of control and that in some ways this had been a very an emotional response from Julie Dixon, um, almost that she had panicked because of the financial difficulties she had got into. Um, However, I think from the prosecution's point of view and certainly from the police point of view, this was a perpetrator who had changed her accounts whenever it had suited her, whenever she had been confronted with new evidence. There was always a line of defence. So it's hard not to see her really as a very skillful and manipulative liar. Judy Dixon didn't take the stand at all, didn't give evidence, was again very impassive, didn't present any emotion at any stage of the court proceedings, merely sat in the dock and appeared to be listening to the proceedings. The extent of the couple's financial difficulties is revealed to the judge. David wouldn't have had a clue about that bankruptcy. He was quite happy going about his everyday business. 
I think if he had found out that he had been declared bankrupt, he would have been incredibly upset being such a proud man. So, yeah, she obviously kept that from him. And I can't see that those finances would have been enough for anyone to lose their life over. At the end of that hearing, Judge Heath had to decide whose account he believed. And he came firmly down on David Twigg's side and said that he in no way believed that David Twigg had wanted to commit suicide. And he described Julie Tickson's account as a pack of lies. The judge was quite damning in his comments and quite clear that he thought it was a cold-blooded murder and that, you know, she, she'd been kind of playing the part and it was potentially worthy of an Oscar nomination if it hadn't been so sad and so true. Julie Dixon is sentenced to life with a minimum of 23 years for the murder of David Twigg. 11 years on, he is still remembered fondly. No sentence can ever bring back a loved one. It will never be enough, of course, and it will never bring David back. Um, but I just hope it brings some little comfort to the loved ones and those who, who, um, who loved David so much. It just beggars belief that anyone would do that to another human being, um, a living person, someone you're supposed to care about, your partner. Um, it's just incredibly difficult to understand how anyone would do that. I think the hardest thing is to wrap your head around is the way she calculated it, how she planned it all, what else was she planning, what else was she thinking. They say it's down to money, we'll never know. Obviously she don't care about anybody because obviously she did what she did, so no one will ever know what's going through her head. This investigation and this case impacted hugely on the community and the village of Burla Marsh. You know, people aren't going to forget what happened. Um, it's, it lives with them forever and whenever the name of the village is sometimes mentioned, people will talk about this case. I know I certainly will never forget it. She was a young woman who had a whole life ahead of her. Everybody was jittery, wondering what had happened to her. Really a very dangerous person. This isn't a real whodunit. Crimes don't really happen here. She'd been placed inside a, a suitcase. This was a brutal, horrific murder and an awful way to leave the body of a, of a teenage girl. I've been a criminal lawyer for over 30 years and I've never dealt with a case like this before. To have three trials is very rare, but the case was of such importance. He would have walked free. And given what he had done before, we were in no doubt that he was a dangerous man. Nestled in the southwest corner of Kent, the so-called Garden of England, this is the leafy historic town of Royal Tunbridge Wells. I would describe Tunbridge Wells as a safe family sort of location, uh, wealthy and middle class. <laughs> There's a really low level of crime in the area. I feel very safe walking around at night. People enjoy a very peaceful life on the whole and generally go about their business. Tunbridge Wells is your archetypal Middle England. It's picturesque. It's surrounded by beautiful countryside. Crimes don't really happen here. But that picture postcard image was about to be shattered. 
Kent police receive a call about a missing person, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds. The day before Easter Monday, Terry had arranged to meet her boyfriend, but she never showed up. This was really out of character. She stayed in contact with her boyfriend regularly. She texted him on the hour almost, and he did the same back to her. They sent multiple texts to each other each day. So the fact that she did not text him was really unusual and set the alarm bells ringing. Terry's boyfriend sent her 20 texts, but she never replied to any of them. Her boyfriend got concerned, tried to phone her, didn't get any response, and then alerted her mum. And her mum then reported her missing to the police. This disappearance was out of the ordinary for the happy-go-lucky teen. She was bright and intelligent. She had eight A-grade GCSEs. She was fiercely independent. She was a teenager who was turning into a young woman. She decided to spread her wings, leaving home at just 16 to live in a housing association hostel in the centre of Tunbridge Wells. She had aspirations to be a nurse. She was waiting to join college. She was too young to start training at that point to be a nurse. But from everything that we've heard, she was a caring, lovely, independent and headstrong, her mother said, but a young woman who had a whole life ahead of her. She was very popular, lots of friends, was a, a girly girl. They described her as always liked to look nice, took care of herself. But those friends were all equally puzzled at her disappearance, the only lead police have. She was five miles away in the town of Tonbridge when she last made contact. She was in touch with her boyfriend, and she'd been to Tunbridge for the day, and she said, I'm in Tunbridge Park, I'll be coming back soon. Um, and then she didn't arrive back in Tunbridge Wells. So we started doing some searching in Tunbridge, because that's where she was last heard of. So police cast their net wide, searching parks, old buildings, rivers, anywhere the missing teen could be. But the trail runs cold. With no other options, police appeal to the public and press for help. Her disappearance makes a big splash across the local media. Tunbridge Wells is a place where, where crime doesn't normally happen. It's a tranquil place. So when a teenage girl goes missing, it becomes a new story. And Terry was just 17 years old. She had a mother, she had a boyfriend. So that's a story of, of, of local significance. Terry going missing was really shocking for the people of Tunbridge Wells. And people were extremely worried. Everybody was jittery wondering where she was and what had happened to her. It's a closed community, people talk, so if there's something that does happen, then word does spread quite quickly. It's ten days since Terry went missing and still no word from her. The family makes another desperate appeal to the public. As time passed, we get more and more concerned when someone doesn't stay in contact. And what we were, we were really more concerned about with this case was she'd not been in touch with her mum. Her mum would tell us that Terry always would, would respond to her. Even if it was a, I don't want to talk to you, she would get a response. So when that didn't happen, obviously the concerns were raised. Concerns are also rising across her close-knit hometown of Tunbridge Wells. I think as the days went by and Terry was missing, fear started to grow that something terrible had happened to her. And there was a big community effort. There were posters everywhere. The taxi drivers all carried flyers. And there was even an information point by police for two reasons. One, to gather information and other reason to try and reassure people because there was a lot of worry at that time. In the meantime, police have been trawling through hours of CCTV footage close to where she was last seen, in the nearby town of Tonbridge. 
Suddenly, there's a breakthrough. Terry is spotted at Tombridge Railway Station on the day of her disappearance. When we checked the CCTV, we actually found that she had actually got on the train to go to Tunbridge Wells. And then checking the CCTV at Tunbridge Wells Railway Station, we found that she, she had got off the train at Tunbridge Wells. So at that point, the search, she moved from Tunbridge to Tunbridge Wells. The investigation suddenly picks up pace in the hunt to find the missing teen. Police now draw up a search plan using this new CCTV sighting. The last sighting of Terry Edmonds was at Tunbridge Wells Rail Station where she got off the train at 6.23. So she walked across here and Terry was never seen again. Investigators plan a search grid around this last known location. The hunt leads to the supermarket car park opposite the station. On the 12th day of Terry's disappearance, there are reports of frenzied police activity on wasteland next to the car park. This area was absolutely cordoned off. There were police everywhere, police vehicles. So the public had absolutely no entry. They closed the car park off while forensics were working at the scene. So this was an absolute no-go area for the public. The search teams had made a grim discovery. The suitcase was discovered under a vehicle ramp going into the car park. And when the searching officers opened it, they found a young lady's body. She was in a fetal position in that suitcase. This young woman appeared to have been mercilessly strangled. She had been placed inside a, a suitcase that had been well hidden behind a wall, a squalid, desolate and dirty spot to, to leave a young girl's body. This was a brutal, horrific murder. When the suitcase was found with a body inside, I think it was the news that everyone had been dreading in a way. But I think most of us had that sinking feeling that it was going to be Terry. Police in Tunbridge Wells have been searching for missing teen Terry Edmonds. On the 12th day of her disappearance, they make a gruesome discovery under a car park ramp close to the station. The body of a teenage girl is found stuffed into a suitcase. She'd been strangled. This was a brutal, horrific murder, a desperately tragic, an awful way to, to leave the body of a, of a teenage girl. The person who killed her had no sense of humanity to, to leave a teenager in, in such a position. The body in the suitcase was found behind a wall, just here. Immediately, police taped off the area and there were lots and lots of police officers, forensic teams, sifting through the area looking for evidence. Police are in no doubt that the body in the dark green suitcase is tragically Terry's. We had to go through formal identification process, but we, we knew from the description that that was Terry in the suitcase. The next day, the body is formally identified as Terry Edmonds. The news rocks the idyllic town of Tunbridge Wells. To hear that she'd been murdered and her body found in such an awful way, stuffed into a suitcase, I think people were absolutely horrified and so sad. Terry's disappearance quickly turned into a murder investigation and that really sent shockwaves through the close-knit community of, of Tunbridge Wells. It scared people primarily because she was a young teenage girl, but also because 
there are many parents in Tunbridge Wells who feared that there could be a killer on the loose. To quell residents' fears, police presence is stepped up across the town. Investigators hit the streets, carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries for any leads on the killer. Kent Police followed a lot of lines of inquiry. They had 50 police officers working on it. They were talking to quite a few people in relation to her disappearance and death. The post-mortem reveals horrifying injuries to the young teen. The details of the post-mortem were shocking. They were horrific. And as a seasoned journalist, it was upsetting. Terry had endured a really brutal and violent attack. She had been physically overpowered. She'd been raped and she'd suffered a number of injuries. And her last moments would have been truly horrific. The post-mortem examination showed that she had grazes on her back and she'd been strangled. Terry was strangled by a scarf that she was wearing. Where it, she looped it through and by pulling it tight, he'd, he'd strangled her. She had some facial injuries where she'd taken some strikes to the face as well. And she was probably smothered with a pink sheet which was found away from the scene. Blood is found on this mysterious pink sheet, which is retrieved with Terry's trainers and her cigarette lighter in a pile of rubbish close to her body. They're sent off for analysis at the lab. But it's the suitcase that police hope could be the key to finding her killer. Once the body had been removed, then the suitcase itself was considered as a crime scene. And that crime scene was essentially packaged up carefully and submitted to the Forensic Science Laboratory for examination. Police hope testing for traces of DNA could provide answers to some of their biggest questions. Initially, we were looking to see where the suitcase had come from. Could we have an owner of the suitcase? Could that be a, a big clue for us? Whilst the lab pours over the suitcase, the spotlight falls on the person who raised the alarm. Terry's boyfriend. New evidence comes to light about a fallout with his girlfriend. The last person that the police were initially aware of that had spoken to Terry was her boyfriend. And they'd had a row. Bearing in mind, most murders are committed by people that are known to the victim. Samples of the boyfriend's DNA are also found on Terry's body. Police investigating the disappearance of 17-year-old Terry Edmonds have today made an arrest. Detectives arrest Terry's boyfriend at his home in the nearby village of Hadlow. He's taken in for questioning. He was living with his mother in a house in Hadlow and when he was arrested, police went to his property, uniformed officers were stationed outside and forensic officers went into his house and conducted a search all night. But eventually, this would draw a blank. They did release him without charge because it was quite clear he was not involved in any way, shape or form. And it was clear he was at work and, and there was no way that he was involved. With the boyfriend eliminated, police focus on the suitcase. Forensic scientists have been putting their star piece of evidence under the microscope, and the suitcase has yielded a significant lead. We recovered various samples, including a sample of DNA from the retractable handle. And the retractable handle had like a, a little switch on it. So we recovered material from that switch and that DNA profile matched an individual that was of interest to the police investigation. That was a, a light bulb moment in the investigation because we felt that, you know, that, that, that would lead investigatively to the identification of a suspect. So police make a second arrest and the man is brought in for questioning. It's a turning point for the investigation. That suspect, in this case, turned out to be the previous owner of the suitcase. 
Now that person then gave information to the police to say, that is my suitcase, but I, I gave that suitcase away. I believe actually it was given to the Salvation Army, so a charity donation. As the police hit another brick wall, the clock's still ticking and there's a brutal murderer on the run. Clearly a dangerous person, clearly a very dangerous person. And trying to get them, this is the real who done it. So detectives have to go back to the drawing board, refocusing their efforts on the location where Terry was found. The car park. Through their inquiries, investigators discover it was often part of her regular journey through town. And she used the car park as a shortcut through, if you like, to make her way back to the hostel that she was staying at that was just at the rear of the car park. Though nothing on the police's CCTV trawl shows Terry's last suspected steps through it. There was no CCTV in the car park itself, but there was CCTV at the exit and she wasn't seen to leave. So we checked everything, double checked it, triple checked it. We couldn't, we couldn't see her leave. Police can now prove Terry never left the car park, which means she must have been killed there. They double down their efforts to find out who else could have been using it on the Easter Monday evening she went missing. We had to look wider and we were looking at other people. And within the car park in Tunbridge Wells, there were some people that, that we called the rough sleepers. They were homeless people who'd found certain areas of the car park, the stairwells of the car park that they used as accommodation. And on those stairwells, certain people sleeping rough there on cardboard mattresses, sleeping bags, duvets, that kind of thing. We started looking at those people to see if there's anyone there was of interest to us. We made inquiries for the rough sleepers in the car park. Did any of them own a suitcase? And they all denied it. But intelligence from an officer on the beat suggests otherwise. A local police officer told us that he knew of one person who had a suitcase. And we looked through our records and we'd spoken to that person, he denied it. So there was a reason why he denied being the owner of a suitcase. With their suspicions raised, detectives head straight back to the car park. They need to find the rough sleeper whose story doesn't quite stack up. We then went and spoke to him again. He said he did have a suitcase, but someone had stolen it and it was kept in the stairwell. Someone had emptied his clothes out from it and the suitcase had gone. But for investigators, something about his story doesn't seem right. So they arrest him. Perhaps this new suspect could blow the case wide open. In Tunbridge Wells, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds has been found dead. She was sexually assaulted and dumped inside a suitcase next to a car park. Police have made another arrest. A local homeless man has been brought in for questioning. 21-year-old Philip Bell. He confirmed that the suitcase that Terry was in was the suitcase that he had previously owned. And we asked him more about it, but he insisted that the suitcase had been stolen. Nevertheless, there were little glitches in his story that were starting to cause the police concern, and that's when they, they started to kind of zone in on him as a suspect. Although police can find no evidence that their victim, Terry Newbell, they realise this isn't the first time he's had a brush with the law. Philip Bell came to Tunbridge Wells from Salisbury and he sort of set up a, a base in Tunbridge Wells. But he had left school at the age of 15 without any qualifications and had started living on the street. He got involved in petty crime, he became a drug dealer. Philip Bell had been in Tunbridge Wells for about two years, living rough, and he was heavily into drugs, so cannabis, crack, speed, solvents. So he was 
a big drug taker and just drifting around, really. And Belle's transient lifestyle puts him at the location where police believe Terry met her fate. The car park. Through their inquiries, police are told Belle had set up home on the landing of one of the disused stairwells. In the basement of that stairwell, forensic investigators find something sinister with a link to Terry. She had some dirt, some debris on her inside her clothes that was directly linked to the bottom of the stairwell. And at the bottom of that stairwell, her blood was found. The fact that her blood, her being in that stairwell and injured was really important because it, it identified the attack site, essentially. So police have found their murder scene. But during questioning, Bell denies he was ever in the stairwell or even the car park at the time when Terry disappeared. He told them that he had nothing to do with Terry's murder and he hadn't even seen her. However... When investigators seize his clothes, something raises their suspicions. Having taken his trousers, they noticed that he had grazing on his knees. And that was consistent with him being astride Terry when he assaulted her and grazing his knees. Now, he said he'd done that playing football. Now, we interviewed all the people that he used to play football with, and none of them ever remembered him actually falling down or hurting his knees whilst playing football in the time frame we were talking about. So again, that disproved part of what he was saying. Although the case against Bell is beginning to build, the evidence is largely circumstantial. Detectives still don't have enough proof to charge their prime suspect with murder. With there being no other evidence at that particular time, we, we had to release him on bail whilst we carried out other inquiries. It's a blow for the investigation. Just days later, searching for answers about her daughter's death, Terry's mum once again makes an emotional public appeal. I am begging you, please, if anybody knows anything, however little, get in touch, because anything to help catch the person that's done this will help. Over the next months, detectives work 24-7 in the hope to get the potentially dangerous Philip Bell back behind bars. They doggedly trawl through hours and hours of the town's CCTV footage for anything that could link him to Terry's disappearance. Suddenly, something catches their eye. Some time later, we were looking at more of the CCTV and we found Philip Bell. We'd found him walking past the railway station and going into the car park just a few seconds after we suspect Terry had gone in. Although we never saw him and Terry together, it was clear from the timing that he followed her in moments after she went into the car park. Police now have proof that their suspected killer and his victim would have crossed paths. And that's not all. We then, about an hour later, we had CCTV of him leaving the car park. So that sort of brought us to a conclusion that she'd gone in, he'd gone in shortly afterwards, he'd come out, but she hadn't. So that added to our suspicions that he could have been responsible. For the investigation team, this is really big. The new CCTV blows apart Bell's claim that he wasn't at the murder scene at the time of Terry's attack. Initially, when Philip Bell was um, arrested and interviewed in May, he denied that he'd returned to the car park. Although there was no CCTV or eyewitness accounts from what happened within the car park, the CCTV was absolutely crucial because it uh, demonstrated that uh, Terry and Philip Bell were effectively on a collision course as they entered the car park. Detectives also spot something strange about Bell's clothing as he leaves the car park. When we suspect was the hour in which Terry was killed, he came out wearing a different pair of jeans 
and we were able to identify that from CCTV because one pair was baggy and one pair was, was slim fitting. So we were asking why, why had he changed that clothing? Soon, investigators come up with a sinister theory. Our theory was that he had got blood on his trousers, taken and disposed of those trousers, and changed them in that hour. Because why else? Why would you suddenly change your trousers halfway through the day? Could this explain Bell's change of clothing? There was only one way to find out. Philip Bell is re-arrested and questioned by detectives once again. He maintained that he was not in the car park around that time on that day. He was then shown the CCTV, which put him in the car park for an hour and him leaving that car park. And he admitted then that he had been in the car park that day and he actually admitted that he'd been in, it was called the Lonely Staircase because there was no exit from it to any main part of the car park. It was where Terry was actually killed. But Bell is adamant he never saw Terry or took part in her attack. Philip Bell had said during that hour between him going to the car park and him coming out of the car park, he'd been in his uh, sleeping area smoking quite a large amount of cannabis. What he said was that he was, his words, stoned on cannabis, which was illegal. That's why he lied to the police about where he was. During that lost hour Bell couldn't account for, he claimed to have smoked over seven grams of cannabis. But evidence from a drug specialist would blow holes in his story. We were able to disprove that through the use of a, a drug expert who was able to analyse the CCTV of him walking in and him walking out and saying, walking out, he was not under the influence of cannabis, such as would have been the case if he'd consumed what he said he had. It seems the suspect who claimed he was high was walking far too steady on his feet. He couldn't be walking in that way if he was smoking a large amount of cannabis in a short period of time. For the team's advisers at the Crown Prosecution Service, the case against Bell is beginning to stack up. CCTV evidence was absolutely key in this case because it provided evidence to undermine Mr Bell's initial account that he hadn't returned to the car park. And it also gave us evidence that he changed his clothing as well during the what we called the lost hour between him entering the car park with Terry and then leaving the car park after he murdered her. Meanwhile, the forensics lab also has exciting news. An item of Bell's clothing that was seized during his first arrest has also yielded a result. In the CCTV of Philip Bell in Tunbridge Wells, he was uh, wearing a very distinctive hooded top. It was a fat farm hoodie. And that hoodie was submitted to the laboratory for examination and on it was a blood stain. It was a very small blood stain, about the size of a penny, that matched Terry Edmonds. And the lab finds more evidence on Bell's belongings that were seized by police in the stairwell where he slept. On his sleeping bag, two large stains of blood. Through DNA testing, these are also confirmed as Terry's. It was absolutely pivotal in the case because it demonstrated that there was a very clear link between Terry Edmonds, her being injured, and the belongings of Philip Bell and that stairwell. To add to that, the pink sheet found near Terry's body that's suspected of being used to smother her throws up more clues in the forensics lab. Not only did it have the blood of Terry Edmonds on it, but it also had a very partial footwear mark and that footwear mark was matched to Philip Bell's training shoes. So collectively and I suppose circumstantially things were starting to build as a case against Philip Bell. Is this the final nail in the coffin for the prime suspect? Forensic investigators find a semen stain on Terry's underwear. That's a partial DNA match to Philip Bell. To 
Today, a local man, Philip Bell, has been charged with the murder of Terry Edmonds. With the evidence stacked against him, the 21-year-old homeless drug dealer is charged with the murder of Terry Edmonds. The news spreads through the town of Tunbridge Wells like wildfire. It meant for the first time we could actually legally name him as the man in connection to Terry's murder. When Philip Bell was charged, I think there was enormous relief that perhaps they had found Terry's killer. Before that, there had been a little bit of impatience from the public. Next day, Bell appears at Seven Oaks Magistrates Court charged with Terry's killing. The scene is set for his trial at Crown Court just three months later. So when there was this breakthrough and it was publicised, I think people felt finally Terry's killer will be brought to justice. In Tunbridge Wells, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds has been found strangled and sexually assaulted, then stuffed inside a suitcase. With the evidence stacked against him, 21-year-old homeless man Philip Bell has been arrested and charged with her murder. He's spotted on CCTV following Terry into a car park, and his hoodie has a stain of blood belonging to his victim. Detectives have built up a chilling theory of how he carried out the attack. He tried it on with her, she refused, and he then, he then attacked her, killed her, and sexually assaulted her. But having done that, he was a homeless person with no car, he had no means to get rid of the body, but he had a suitcase. So he put the body in a fetal position in the suitcase. A year after Terry's disappearance, Philip Bell's trial begins at Maidstone Crown Court. He pleads not guilty to her murder. The thing that struck me about him was he was completely emotionless the whole time. You look into their eyes and, and there was nothing there. It, it was quite chilling, actually. But as the trial progresses, police realise convincing the court of Bell's guilt may not be an open and shut case. The case against Bell relied entirely on circumstantial evidence. There was no smoking gun, there was no witness who saw him kill Terry Edmonds. I think that Philip Bell also had a very good defence barrister who was able to just chip away at the little bits of, of evidence. It became really a massive trial. I, I was giving evidence for, for days on end. And before long, Bell's defence team has a trick up their sleeve to try and raise doubts in the jury. They point the finger at another rough sleeper in the same car park, one of Bell's associates. The man had a conviction for manslaughter. And because he lived in the car park, it was suggested by the defence that he was the murderer. Not only that, but the defence's new suspect could undermine one of the team's key pieces of evidence, the footprint on the pink sheet used to smother Terry. The man had a pair of Converse trainers found in his possession, which were linked to the pink sheet found at the scene with a bloody footprint that matched that pair of trainers. Following a dramatic trial lasting six weeks, the jury retires. After 22 hours spent deliberating, they failed to reach a verdict. For Kent Police and the prosecution team, their worst fears have come true. All the evidence against Philip Bell, it seemed very strong. So I was very disappointed, very disappointed for, for Terry's mum not being able to get any justice and for the, the rest of her family. With no verdict reached by the jury, the judge orders a retrial. 
Seven months later, a second trial begins and a brand new jury hears the case against Philip Bell. But again, we had the same situation with evidence being chipped away at by the defence team. I was thinking, oh no, not again, because I was really concerned that it would be the same Groundhog Day kind of scenario. This time, the defence focuses on Bell's hoodie. They claim there was an innocent explanation for Terry's blood on it. They suggested that Philip Bell had brushed past the area where Terry's blood was and got it on his top. Again, I think that what they did was they raised a doubt about that and the jury just couldn't be sure of it. Following 19 hours of deliberation, the jury has news. I think it's fair to say you could cut the atmosphere in that courtroom, in Maidstone Crown Court, with a knife. Once again, a jury has failed to reach a verdict. This is another massive blow for, for Terry Edmonds' family. They'd sat now through two lengthy trials. There was, on my part, a real sense of um, shock and disappointment when the jury were una unable to uh, return a verdict and um, then having to decide what we were going to do. The team is on the verge of calling it quits. Now, if we had done that, Bell would have walked free and Terry's killer would never have been brought to justice. But in a last-ditch effort to save the case, the prosecution tries for something rarely attempted in British legal history. A third trial of the same defendant. And so we argued that it was in the interests of justice to go a third time, which is unusual. It was the right thing to do. That We had an overwhelming case that Terry had been murdered by Philip Bell. It's a close call, but the judge sides with the prosecution and agrees to keep Bell in custody until the retrial. So the team has one last chance to put Bell behind bars. If the case fails, then he is going to walk free and he could be dangerous. So the prosecution goes back to basics. First, they tackle Bell's claim that he brushed past Terry's blood left on the stairwell. Forensic scientists run tests using the same small amount of blood that was found on Bell's hoodie. This tiny amount would have started drying if he'd touched it after the attack. So you can see that if the blood has started to dry quite considerably, the stains start to break up. They're quite gritty, they're quite flaky. But the stain on Bell's top seemed fresh, questioning his version of events. The blood stain on the hooded top was not flaky. It was fresh looking blood that had been transferred. So it demonstrated that it wasn't drying blood. So that blood must have transferred very quickly after it was available, which started to put Philip Bell being involved in the assault on Terry Edmonds and being exposed to her blood after she was injured. Not only is the forensic evidence building better than before, this time the prosecution have also found a new star witness who has come forward to the police. 15-year-old girl came and gave her account about how she had been invited to go to the stairwell that Philip Bell was staying in. And quite chillingly, she described what we believed had happened to Terry, her being straddled by him and being bruised by him and him trying to assault her. But very fortunately for her, somebody came and disturbed them and she was able to escape. That was just exactly how we imagined that the, the attack had taken place on Terry. And you could hear a pin drop. It was compelling evidence and it showed in law that he had what we call a propensity to commit this type of offence. As the prosecution's case seems to get stronger, Bell's testimony on the stand just falls apart. He admits being on the stairwell landing at the time of Terry's attack, but says he saw nothing. 
He's within 10 feet of Terry being murdered, and yet sees and hears nothing. It was fanciful. So a jury considers the evidence against Bell for a third time. Just three hours later, they announce their decision. Guilty. It was a day of jubilation, really, for the family. There were loud shouts and cheers as the verdict was announced in Maidstone Crown Court. There was an outpouring of pent-up emotion that had been there for a long period of time. It was extremely satisfying when we were able to um, hear the guilty verdict and realise that we'd um, achieved some sort of justice for Terry's family. Philip Bell is eventually sentenced to 28 years in jail. He was evil. That's how the judge described him after the trial, and that's a fair description of him. Justice is a consolation for the family, but it will never bring their beloved daughter back. Terry was a bright, intelligent girl, and she had a long life to look forward to that was cruelly taken away by Philip Bell, for no reason, really. And the case has left its mark on the quiet Kent town of Tunbridge Wells. I think Tunbridge Wells has never really got over the murder of Terry Edmonds, and I think the wounds are still there in Tunbridge Wells because Terry was part of our community and a lovely young woman. You could feel that fear and sadness that this had happened in our town.